I'd like to call the meeting to order. All those that can, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call, please. Uh, we're all present except for Mr. Salvia. All right, the next item, uh, approval of agenda. I'd like to modify the agenda by removing items 9A, 9C, and 9D. Okay, could I um, propose that we take on the consent agenda that if we can take chill at the mill off of the consent agenda so that we could discuss it before voting on it? We can vote on it. Going sure. back on yours, huh? nine, nine doesn't have a C or D. Oh, 10 C or D. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Sam, which were the ones you wanted to remove? 9A, 10C, and 10D. And Ms. Chinalis would like to roll, um, I guess that we could call that. Um, we can just address it right after. Right after the consent agenda yeah. approval. Or you can put it under new business. Yeah, let's let's um, <coughs> let's put it uh, under. Uh, we'll make it um, ten C. Is that all right? So we're gonna make chill at the middle ten C. Do we have an explanation why these things are being taken off? Sure. The um, first item, uh, 9A, um, I had a phone conversation with the individual that was interested in finding out whether he could do the airsoft um, field at uh, Hickory Pines Park. And um, he said that in light of some of the conversation that he's received, you know, information he's received, he felt that he probably was best to not even put it into that um, scenario, so he asked if we would remove it from the consideration. So it will no longer be considered for uh, the public park at any point in time. So, um, <laughs> now on that note, uh, I might as well say it right now, um, because we're not going to be discussing it, we're not going to discuss it, but I would like to say that it does make a difference when people make comments. And a lot of times things just, we have to kind of go on some gut feelings that we have or how we feel about, you know, I personally don't have any major problem with it, but what I did find out by a couple of things that I'll tell you about. One is Judy Cooper came to me a few days ago and said, you ought to go on YouTube. <laughs> I went on YouTube and went, wow, <laughs> maybe that's not the best thing to do there it's a public park you know you so these things kind of come up it might not be the best location for it do I have a problem with airsoft no I don't uh, I used to play a game I would have liked to have had the airsoft when I was a kid so when I shot the neighbor boy he couldn't say no you didn't hit you know? so but and not being facetious I mean, I'm not a person that believes in uh, you know shooting and killing and all that stuff but it's games we played forever but um, the comments that I did receive from neighbors and from some others that were concerned about it that weren't neighbors, uh, they make a difference. I, I, some of them were pretty hefty on the uh, commentary, but the reality is if you don't get hefty sometimes, there's things that we could miss and maybe misunderstand. It helps us make better decisions. So your emails, your comments, your present doesn't go on deaf ears. Uh, somebody did send me an email that said it seemed to be a done deal. Uh, 
I don't know how that came about because it was never a done deal. A done deal is when we vote on it and you're either in favor or against it. That's a done deal. Each of us are just one vote. None of us have the ability to be able to dictate how something will come out. It's each one of our own opinion. We vote our own minds. So uh, appreciate those that uh, did come out for this because it makes a statement. Um, the emails we did get, the information we did get, the comments we did get make a difference. Um, more often than not, we don't hear the other side because people who don't care don't say anything about it. So we have to look at it from the perspective of what kind of information is presented, how seriously researched <coughs> it's presented. If it's just a, I hate it, and you say I hate it, and we, it doesn't mean that that's going to sway us because the person hates something. There's 50-50 there's everything there. So, But the research done on some of them was pretty good. I mean, uh, YouTube is a resource that can you can learn from all the time. I use it a lot for um, things that I like to do. Um, never thought about looking up airsoft because I I have paintball guns and I you know so but different sport different ideas. The YouTube was something that was you know I thought it was a quiet sport. Judy and I had some fun with it today. I mean it was. <laughs> What would you say when I shot you? And uh, <laughs> the verbiage might be different than a soccer player going, kick the ball, you know. So I get it and I appreciate it, and that's why um, I wanted to make this statement tonight. So your board does listen, and uh, we do uh, trust that our constituents have feelings that we don't want to step all over either. And it was a thought. Would it work there? It's an outdoor activity. It's a physical thing. Is it the right thing? Another thing I will say on the YouTube video, um, I saw a lot of BBs all over the place in, some, in these industrial sites. So uh, you don't think about somebody going, and there's uh, 500 BBs somewhere. So it's a good point, and I think that uh, the individual uh, made a good decision, and it was his choice to, to do so. And, he does not want to be somebody that disrupts the public or the community or ticks them off for something that he's not trying to do. So that's his opinion, and, and uh, I really respect that, and saves us a lot of hassle too. So <laughs> we don't we don't have to continue with this. Um, so thank you for coming out. I appreciate that. All right. So back to the agenda. Uh, we're going to move chill to mill to 10C, removing 9A. 10C and 10D. And why are they? And <laughs> yesterday I got a phone call from the um, Mr. Brown, Kevin Brown from Pearl and Mishta in their second round of uh, uh, conversations on funding decided they were not going to fund the project. So the project's on hold. Uh, what we don't want to do is we're not, and so both of those items relate to that parcel so rather than having discussions on them and voting on the ordinance stuff we'll wait and see what happens because as you know the Planning Commission is kind of split on three-story um, and is that something we should keep blah 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 so there's a lot of things that uh, uh, relate to that um, I will say that uh, I'm have been talking with other um, people that have parcels he's interested in still doing it septic is the problem so uh, they really don't like to loan on limited uh, sewage treatment facilities. They prefer to have a sewer system. So uh, that's another one of these items like McDonald's who had to spend a fortune on their septic and Highland House who almost moved out of Highland because of their cost of their septic. Um, <clears throat> actually, there's a presentation today that will show you some things about uh, Highland House and expenses they had in terms of water. <laughs> so um, that's the rationale behind pulling those up. So, any other questions on that? <coughs> uh, could I get a motion to approve as amended? I would move to approve the agenda as amended. Support. Vote, right. please. Mr. Howe? Yes. 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 
Yeah. Who cares? Keep me on track. I'm trying to see it now. <laughs> okay, so uh, next item consent is consent agenda approval as amended. I would move to approve the consent agenda as amended. Support. Moved and supported. A vote, please. Mrs. Chenoweth? Yes. 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 Motion carries. Okay, announcements and information inquiry. Um, today is National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. Matt, thank you for your. Uh, yes. Now he's got to go pass that on to all his employees and. <coughs> And You've been showered with gifts. Right <laughs> <laughs> Cheeseburgers, I heard of those. Donuts. Okay. Um, Highland Township will be closed for Martin Luther King Jr. Day on Monday, January 21st at 2019. Um, so, number seven, public comment. And, uh, yes. Dale Fagley, 1450 Pettibone Lake Road. Brought this up once before and it seems to have gotten no legs. I'm going to bring it up again. Is there any chance that some of this money you get from Comcast could be used to make a contract with them and wire somebody out in my area? Rather than just dump it back into the general fund? Can you ask nicer? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's a question. I, I guess that's a good question. Um, we'll task that to, to look into it. Thank you. I know there's lots of people. I think the, the key is, is is there a solution that would allow it to be to everybody that doesn't get it? Um, we'll look into it. I'll see what uh, if I can find how many people are not have no access to Comcast. Well, at least start someplace, and you know, I don't know. So the best point to start, what's your address? That's the place. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, I'm Dale, right. where do you live <coughs> from here? Where, where, where do you live? Head of Head of Lake Lake Road. Road. <coughs> okay. He lives in a hollow that uh, makes it very difficult to get any kind of wireless stuff. We got a hot wireless. spot and it works, but I mean, it's not that I would do it because I'm computer challenged, but to stream something, I mean, you know, we get so many gigs on our hotspot, and one movie probably wipe it out. You know, so or even if it had the capacity to do it, I don't know. I will say that I have done a boatload of research on trying to find an avenue for wireless Wi-Fi for the township, and what happens is the companies like there's a company that does the thumb area because the, these farms are so far apart. Uh, there, there's another company that did uh, Fowlerville and uh, Weberville area, but they don't want to come into our area because cable is so prevalent that they wouldn't get enough purchasers to be able to <coughs> set up the system, which means um, they have to play with towers and things. Unless it was the cable company that was doing it. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure they don't want to because we've... Well, the same cable things. company yeah. that is here. Yeah, they're not, I know they're not interested, because I've already asked that question. But um, it doesn't mean that we can't still find that type of avenue. There are things that are, have come about in the last couple of years. Um, we are connected with the fire department with our computer system with an antenna that has the capability to go up to 50 miles. You do need to have fairly clear sight, but we do have some big towers and some places that we possibly could put them to maybe do some mm -hmm. something like that and that's what that wireless Wi-Fi is that they just set up a tower that's got a broadcasting <coughs> system they do it all over Canada um, and then you have an antenna that points at that and that's what we'll we probably should do, look into it and see what we can do with it so I'll, I'll research I that further. I had the kind where did I see you at, Dale? We had the conversation. Where were we at? Somewhere. Somewhere. And he reminded me, and I forgot we talked about it. And then, you know, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of Comcast. That's what we have. But um, 
I would think we need, really need to pursue something because I, we had this conversation a long time ago. I remember, I think when first came on the board, when I first got elected, I think we had this conversation. Before my hair was gray. Yeah, I, had, I, had about three, I had three hairs back then, too. So, um, so we need to, I think we really need to pursue something because I, I feel bad for the ones that, I mean, I get nothing. That's ridiculous. I mean, especially in this day and age. It's not like we're living up in the northern Montana or somewhere. Probably got better options up there. But. Well, I'll give you an example of how sad it is here. I went to Peru a couple of years ago, and I did the Inca Trail, which goes from north to south. Never lost full 4G service the entire time. Had a conversations with some people here, some developers here for a piece of property, in a bus, riding down a mountain road at 12,000 feet, and had full 4G and never lost. And it was that way the whole trip, everywhere we went. So. It can be done. We just don't want to do it here because economics actually do make sense, but they don't want to do it. So, um, all right. Thanks, Thanks for your uh, input. Thank you, seriously. Thanks for reminding me. Yep. Any other comments? Oh, the man in the uh, green jacket. All right. First thing. Um, Name and address. James Brennan, 2466 Amelia. At the corner of Wardlow and Harvey Lake, the north one has a light. The south one does not. The south one has had multiple accidents in the last year of people going through that intersection. Now granted, there is a stop ahead sign. There is a arrow pointing both directions that the road ends, but people keep missing it. And I think by adding a traffic light there, just a little intersection light, would alleviate a lot of that problem because it is so dark in that area that you probably don't see it in time. And with tree growth around the signs, you won't see it at all. My next topic is I want to say what, what, where, where is it at again? Where's it at? Wardlow and Harvey Lake, the southern one. intersection. Wardlow. Okay. Yes. If you're heading east, it dead ends at Harvey Lake Road. Yes, and that's the intersection. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> People are trying to see how close they can get to the big black arrow on the yellow sign. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they've taken out that sign yeah. several times. Now my other comment, I want to thank Mrs. McDonald at the last meeting. And I'd also like to congratulate Mr. Salvia, Mrs. Chenoweth, and Mr. Howe for locking out all the trustees from a township decision. And if you want to know more about it, you can get with me after the meeting. All right, thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> All right, um, I'm going to move on to the next item. And uh, Lisa, I'm going to need your help on this one. Okay. Okay, just sit still. Okay. All right, I want everybody to know that there's a person in this office for this building here, sitting in the second row. I don't know, I can't really yell any longer, but there's a person in this room sitting in the second row who has done more service to this community as an employee in this township than anybody else. Um, Lisa Burkhart celebrates her 40th year working for Highland Township. She started when she was th three? Three, yes. Three years old. <laughs> so, on that note, I've known Lisa for many, many years before I came into office. I mean, I had to come in and go before her when she was, uh, when I needed things done that had to do with zoning and so on and so forth. And she has held a position that is probably one of the most ungrateful jobs in the building. It's dealing with zoning and ordinance issues. Very hard, very hard job because you have to affect people that don't think they're doing anything wrong. Uh, it's just a big, hard thing to do. It's hard for me to understand how she can handle it. But she's done a phenomenal job in all these years of being able to figure out how to deal with it all and still show up and, and be a, an awesome employee, and we really appreciate that. So um, I'm going to try and read this, if I can uh, see it now I get myself teared up. It's a proclamation honoring Lisa Burkhardt for 40 years of service, F-O-R-T-Y, 
And 12 days. And 12 days. It's <laughs> <laughs> another thing she does. She tracks everything. So she, she's. And I also want to add that whenever somebody has, a, we'll have conversations in the building, and somebody will say, "Do you remember such and such a piece of property?" And uh, what was the blah 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 blah? And I don't know. I don't remember that. And then we go to Lisa. Oh, that was so and so. And in 1922 or whatever, they <laughs> she's got a memory. That was before your time. <laughs> Bad example, but like a fly trap, everything sticks in there, and it just doesn't. She'll let it out, and she's always got the answer for us. So uh, I just I can't think of. Enough at being able to retain that for uh, for the the benefit of the entire public here. So <clears throat> this proclamation, whereas on this ninth day of January, 2019, the Highland Township Board of Trustees recognizes and gives thanks to Lisa Burkhart for 40 years, 12 days, of dedicated service to residents of Highland Township, and whereas in December 1978, when you were three. Mm -hmm. Lisa began her career at Highland Township as a floater learning how local government operates and working as needed throughout the township, taking on every challenge that presented itself, including keeping the supervisor organized and on task. She's been through more supervisors than anybody in this community. Um, it's pretty weird. I look at it. I'm skipping in the middle here. I think about this. Supervisors come and go, and they're voted in, and they're, they walk in, and they affect for a little while, but this individual has affected for 40 years and had to put up with all the different styles of management and you name it and still continue to charge forward. And whereas in 1991, Lisa was promoted to zoning administrator. As zoning administrator, Lisa revamped the land use records, oversaw permits for fencing, signs, and land divisions, and acted in the role of Highland's official tough guy enforcing ordinances and battling annoyances from neighbors and friends alike. <clears throat> and whereas Lisa turned her attention from keeping the supervisor on track to keeping the entire planning process on track, working tirelessly with the Planning Commission, consultants, and Zoning Board of Appeals on endless agendas, files, minutes, and construction projects through the busy, busy decade of the 90s, when the township experienced its greatest growth period. <clears throat> and whereas Lisa stretched and grew in her roles, providing Proving her skills and hard earned education through achieving the status of certified planner, AICP, which is awarded to those who have demonstrated experience and knowledge of the planning field. And whereas Lisa willingly became the township's subject matter expert for the administration of cell tower contracts, land divisions, watershed, native species, and invasive species, among many, many things. <clears throat> And whereas Lisa is always willing to share her wealth of knowledge in other areas, many of, us, many of us will still have the pleasure of working with her in her unsung position of resident historian. Now therefore be it resolved, Highland Township Board of Trustees, employees and residents wish to congratulate Lisa Burkhart for 40 years of dedicated service representing Highland Township in good times and bad. <laughs> So we had a project that I needed her help on and because I didn't want to spill the beans on this. I'm pretty sure she's pretty smart and probably figured it out, but she's done a good job of faking it. So, um, Lisa, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, the next item, we've got two presentations. Uh, the first one is going to be the fire chief. It's uh, 2018 in review. Yeah, no, I'm switching it up on you. Oh, okay. I'm sitting back down. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to mess with him, so I had to. 
Okay, you're using this Google stuff, so hopefully this will work. I love Google. Good evening, all members of the audience, those watching us on YouTube. Uh, my name is Ken Chapman, Fire Chief for Highland Township. Uh, presenting with me tonight is Gary Bonham. He's Fire, fire Lieutenant, Paramedic for our Fire Department. Uh, we'd like to make a little presentation on our five-year strategic plan moving forward. <clears throat> Tell me when to shoot. I want to, I want to say these are just benchmarks. It's not a set in stone goal that year one we're doing this, year two we're doing this, year three we're doing this. Merely benchmarks on, on kind of the direction we want to go. Go ahead and slide to the next one. All right, real quick, at 7.51 p.m., Oakland County Emergency Dispatch begins receiving calls of a loud crash or explosion in the area south of Lone Tree, east of Milford. The incident is located on the railroad tracks east of High Point Estate Subdivision. On arrival, fire and sheriff's office personnel find a train with several cars off the track. Liquids can be seen leaking as well as a visible vapor plume. At 8.06, Highland, fire, Highland Township Fire Department requests response by Oakland County Hazardous Materials Response Team as well as Oakland County Incident Management Team and an activation of the Oakland County Homeland Security Emergency Operations Center. As elected officials for the township, do you know what your roles would be at if we had to activate the EOC? We so sign putting us on the spot. Here, so <laughs> every every uh, few years we have to re-sign re the emergency operations plan put out by Oakland County Emergency Management. Um, you guys do play a role in any incident like this. As the process becomes larger or if it's a larger scale incident, we need to get reimbursement from federal funding. There's a process that has to be in involved. You guys are part of that process. In 2017, December, we probably made a, almost as good of a choice as we did in August of 2016. Uh, we hired the fire marshal slash ordinance officer. In his previous life, he was the emergency manager. That was kind of his goal. Over the next year, we plan on, and I'm not, I hope I'm not stepping on your presentation. Over the next year, we hope to get you guys on board with the minimal NIMS requirements, and, and we'll go over some things that we need to do. Next slide, please. And this is why. <clears throat> April 25th, 1989. Picture on the board is a picture of a train derailment. This was the Dow Chemical so-called death train from Midland, Texas, going to Midland, Michigan. There were 10 cars that derailed from the, the uh, train. The event took, fortunately there was no leaks. The event took three days to remediate, uh, riding cars, moving product from the full rail cars onto road um, transport vehicles to get the product out of here. If that, would have been something that was leaking or spilling product, it could have been a whole different story. This was in Highland. The, the picture shows the parking lot right behind the Shell gas station. Uh, just to the east is a lake. So again, if there would have been any leaking liquid, it could have been an ecological nightmare for the community and the surrounding areas. Uh, it can happen. It has happened. And this is the kind of stuff that, as a fire department, <coughs> we prepare for. Next slide, please. The fire service is forever evolving. Uh, up on the screen right now, you have a couple pictures from the 70s, early 80s. Um, on the left, you'll see the guys with pull-up boots, jackets, plastic helmets. On the right, <coughs> gear hasn't changed much, but you see something on their back. It's called an SCBA. Uh, over the past 100 years, they've been developing breathing apparatus for uh, not just firefighters, but during war times to help those that are working do the job in, in dangerous environments. They started using them and they became more predominant in the 80s in, in most fire service, all fire services nowadays, you'll see it because it's part of an NFPA standard. Next slide. This is a modern day firefighter. If you look at him from head to toe, he's, all of his skin is covered, it's protected. Um, what he has on right there, the jacket, pants, and there's a Nomex hood that goes underneath his helmet. That runs $2,650. The boots are $300, special boots for doing our job. The helmet's another $370. And then the SCBA on his back is approximately $9,400. We, we tackle our budget every year. We try and spend it as um, frugally and as responsible as possible. This is an expensive prof profession. 
it takes a lot of money to provide the equipment to protect my staff when they're going in and doing their jobs. What you see there is just one part of our job. There's also thermal imaging cameras that we're using nowadays, uh, forceful entry equipment, which you see in his hands there a little bit, <coughs> hose, nozzles, and as you know, last year we purchased a $651,672.12 fire truck. It's an expensive job. But this is a modern day firefighter. This is what it costs nowadays to operate um, as a fire service. Next slide. Gary? And as Chief Chapman was saying, the fire department is constantly evolving every year. They started out as just homeowners throwing buckets of water on homes, not, uh, not saving a whole lot. As you can see here, we've, we've sort of metamorphosized into providing EMS. We do vehicle extrication and stabilization on car accidents. We do next slide. Next slide. Air monitoring for carbon monoxide and other gas, other uh, gases, <coughs> hazardous materials, ice, uh, ice rescue, which we do with the Oakland County Sheriff's Department a lot. Um, the, ha the hazardous materials, we uh, actually have some members that are part of the Oakland County Hazmat team. So our our department is actually just um, we're operations trained. We're not technic. We're not technicians. But the technicians would actually come from the Oakland County um, Hazmat team. We do have, I think, two or three techs on our team. Three. They're on our department. Three technicians on our team. They're on our department that are um, part of the Hazmat team. Um, next slide. Swift water rescue, high angle, and trench rescue. These are all technical rescue, um, technical rescue team stuff. We don't. We don't have a technical rescue team, so anything like this happens, we have to call the Oakland County Tech Team. We do have, um, I think Mike Becker is the only one right now currently, right? Correct. We have one member that is part of the technical rescue team that is here in Highland. So anything like this happens, we're calling them, and it could be a little bit before anybody gets here to help out. So maybe somewhere down the road we can you know, financially support our own team. I don't know. It's very expensive, but... It might be something to shoot for in the future. We welcome to 2018 for <coughs> AMS service. Uh, NFPA 3000 Asher standard. Asher stands for Active Shooter Hostile Environment Response Tactical EMS. Um, this is the next evolution in, in the fire service. In 2017, after some events in previous years, NFPA NFPA is a National Fire Protection Administration. Or association, they, they created all the standards that the fire service operates under um, or uses to purchase equipment. In 2017, after some events in the country, they decided they needed to make some, some moves. So they formed a technical committee called Cross-Function Emergency Preparedness and Response. This committee was made up of fire department personnel, law enforcement, EMS, emergency management associations, um, just a bunch of specialists that are, are uh, familiar with this kind of stuff and they created the Asher NFPA 3000 Asher standard. The committee was formed in 2017, the standard was put out in 2018. I don't believe that's ever been done in the history of the National Fire Protection Association. Normally it sits in committee for five, six, seven, eight years, but because of events, they, they truly they sped up the process and it worked out really well. Next slide, please. The next couple slides are uh, Asher events in our, our uh, country, starting back in 1999 with the Columbine High School, which is really where this started. We started seeing more and more in 99. Um, the first slide's deaths. Loss of life is horrible, um, but there's really not much we can do for the victims or for the victims. Next slide, please. This is where it plays into more of a fire and EMS role. Uh, the injured, how do we keep them from going from the injured to the next step? And that's what the ASHER standard was put together for. It was to help us develop SOG standards and, and processes to provide aid in active shooter hostile environments. So you understand the slide because you probably can't read what's on the bottom there. Those are all, um, 
different events, different and, events and that one with the 851 is the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival. That was in uh, the Las Vegas. Um, and let me give you a, just a real quick rundown on, on years. First one, Columbine High School, 1999. West Nickel Mine School, 2006. Virginia Tech shooting, 2007. North Illinois University, 2008. Oikos University, 2010. Guardia Sick Temple, 2012. Sandy Hook, 2012. Uh, Marysville Pilchuck High School, 2014. Emanuel African American Episcopal Church, 2015. Military Recruiting Center, um, Pukwa. Uh, we had th four events in 2015 going all the way to Inland Regional Center. We had the Pulse Nightclub in 2016. And then in 2017, which is when they created this uh, technical committee to create the Asher Standard, we had another two large <coughs> events. The Unite the Right Rally, where the young lady was run over by a car, a terrorist using a, a vehicle to commit a hostile act, and then the Route 91 Harvest Fest Music Festival happened in 2017 as well. Um, that's when they created the Asher Standard. We've had a few more events. These are just the large scale events that we've seen as a nation. U.S. terrorist events. Um, this is something else where we're constantly going to classes for uh, terrorism awareness, um, coordinated attacks. The county is very good about providing the training for us because as you look at the schedule up, up top, 1993 is when they made the first attack on the World Trade Center. We had the Homeland Terrorists in 95 on the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, 2001, we had the, the terrorists went from using bombs to using planes, uh, Pentagon, Flight 93. In 2013, the terrorists evolved again. They started using backpack bombs. Boston, Boston uh, Marathon bombing. And then in 2017, again, they were using vehicles to commit damage. This is just in the United States. I'm sure everybody's seen across or around the world, uh, Paris, Germany. They're always finding ways to make us not want to go out and, and scare us into staying at home. And, and fortunately, we've been able to defeat them. Well, we don't have the population to be a target or a high hazard target for the for a terrorist. Again, as terrorism evolves, <coughs> stuff that we always have to look at. We have a lot of critical infrastructure in our community. On the east end, we've got the vector pipeline system, um, as well as on the southeast end, we're right on the border of the DTE consumers energy pipelines. On the west end, we've got the Enbridge pipelines. We have a million gallon water tank right in front of cobblestone. We've got the ITC transmission lines. <coughs> These are all We've got M59, which is the main um, evacuation route for everything in Pontiac. These are all stuff that as a fire department we have to be prepared for, and we have to look at how do we respond, what happens if, what happens when. Uh, next slide, please. And the next slide is tornadoes. That's something that we can relate to. We, we never want to relate to terrorism, but we can relate to a tornado happening in our town. Um, if you look over the past 30 years, in the 90s, uh, we experienced, or they recorded, 2,046 tornado events. There were 515 lives lost from 1990 to 1999. From 2000 until 2009, they recorded 4,240 tornadoes. We lost 497 uh, residents. This is just in the U.S. From 2010 until December 2nd, 2018, when the slide was put together, They've already recorded 3,904 tornadoes, and we've lost 850 uh, citizens just in the U.S. Why am I telling you all this? As a fire department, our job is preparedness. We have to be ready for what's next, what's going to happen, how do we respond to our community's needs. Where are the insurance policy? for our residents, for our businesses, and for any visitor that comes to our town. We're trying to make sure that your insurance premiums, which is your tax dollar, is spent and you're getting the most bang for your buck. Next slide, please. As you'll see in this slide, uh, this is a, a rehash of some of our old slides from other presentations. If you look back pre-1970, we were running about 200 to 250 runs per year. 
Uh, we had a slow increase up until just before 1990, where we got up into 400 runs a year. In the 90s, we picked up, <coughs> as Gary, as Lieutenant Bonham mentioned earlier, as the fire service uh, transition, we started doing extrication in EMS. In the 90s, we got extrication equipment. We were the only community in this area that had the jaws of life. Um, in the late 90s, we started picking up EMS, and then you can just see a progress of, of run volumes as we go. In 2017, the last number that's on there is 1,399 runs. That was 2017. We just completed 2018, where we turned 1,362 calls for service. <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, we are a paid on call fire department. Uh, we rely on a private EMS company to provide ambulance transport for us, uh, but we still respond to all the incidents. Um, just like our department and many all the departments surrounding us, run volumes have gone up. Star EMS has also seen an increase in run volumes, whether it's uh, because of services that they're providing to communities or, or agencies that they're picking up or contracts that they're picking up, their run volume has increased, which has caused them to not be responding from our station. We have a great luxury in this town. Star EMS, since the mid-2000s, has provided advanced life support, ambulance transport to our community. Uh, prior to that, it was provided by AMR, which went bankrupt, walked out. We were left high and dry for quite a long time or for quite a while, I should say, a long time. Star EMS doesn't charge us anything to station a rig in our, our township. Um, all they do is they, they collect their EMS revenue. Uh, in 2017, as I mentioned earlier, we just purchased a fire truck. That the fire truck was designed to respond on all emergencies. That way, if we're out on it, as a paid-on-call system, we have two guys on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <coughs> and then other people are coming from home to respond. The idea behind Engine 11 was to make it an all-response vehicle. We respond out on medicals, we respond out on trees down, on structure fires, car fires. It can handle anything we run out, uh, go out on. Uh, ice water rescues, anything we go out on, it can handle it. Unfortunately, because STARS responses or responsibilities elsewhere <coughs> are taking them out of our township, on average, 40% of the time, they're responding from somewhere other than Highland, or from the Highland Station. They could be at Duck Lake in 59, they could be at Airport in 59. We don't know until we get notified from the uh, dispatchers, but we have to make a decision, or our duty crews have to make a decision on how they're going to respond. It would be horrible to be out on an EMS run, <coughs> you clear from that because Star is doing the transport, you're in a Bravo, and all of a sudden you get a call for a structure fire. You got to leave the, the scene, go back to a station, pick up your fire truck, and then go out to the scene. Um, that was why Engine 11 was designed the way it was. Did I miss anything, Gary? No. Star's doing a great job. Uh, it, it's this is. We're not trying to put any slight towards it. It's just as the service evolves, we're leaning towards a, another route. Next slide, please. And Gary, you're up. For those of you that don't know, I work for STAR full-time, so I'm certainly by any means not trying to run my bread and butter out of, out of, the play, out of this township. Um, but we've been doing some, some tracking, and um, Firefighter Brennan actually has come up with a spreadsheet that's allowing us to track things um, like um, response times and locations, and we've got like six different things right now that we're tracking to try to keep an eye on everything so that we can provide the best service for you know for you people for you people for us for everybody um, that's our goal if, if we can't do that something needs to change we need to evolve like the chief was talking about earlier right now we are uh, a basic uh, basic life support fire department we can we can do basic life support stuff which does anybody know the difference between advanced life support and basic life support other than the firefighters in here? Okay, we'll get, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, currently we respond on all, emergence, on all requests for medical, emergence, for medical emergencies. Um, as Chief uh, Chapman said, STAR EMS does our, our ALS for us and we transport about 
we transport about 3% of our calls, which can only be transported basic because that's all we're licensed to do. Um, and as Chief mentioned that uh, earlier, the entire country is experiencing a shortage of paramedics and EMTs. Whether it's the money or the job security or whatever the reason is, everybody's experiencing a shortage. STARS call volume is picked up, almost doubled, whether it's because, like Chief was saying, fire departments are getting more calls. Our calls go up every single year. We're not the only fire department, you know, we're not the only township whose call, calls go up every year. So now STARS trying to help those people and help these people, and it's just, um, something's gonna have to give eventually. So as you'll see in a, in a little bit here, we're gonna talk about um, possibly going to an advanced life support system for our, uh, for our township. Um, and as Chief said, it's not nothing set in stone. We'll get to it in a second. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay. <clears throat> Basic life support versus advanced life support. Basic life support's great. It, it does pretty much the bare minimum, and I mean, it's not, I don't mean that as a bad thing, but it, it will provide airway support. It will provide, you know, we can do CPR, we can defibrillate, we can, we can do a lot of stuff. These are the things that we can do as advanced life support. We can do cardiac moni monitoring, which basically if you're having chest pain, right now if you're having chest pain, we can show up, we can check your blood pressure and your pulse and do a basic set of vitals. I can't look at your heart because I don't have a monitor, unless I'm working for STAR, then I can't. But um, we can't look at your heart and say, yep, sir or ma'am, you're having a heart attack. We need to go right now. We can't do that, okay? Most people don't really want to hear that anyway. They kind of want us to lie. But <laughs> ALS, ALS can do that. They can do a thing called cardioversion, which is if your heart is in a lethal rhythm, we can shock your heart back into a normal sinus rhythm. It doesn't sound pleasant. It's not pleasant. It hurts, but it saves your life. I've been cursed at before when I did that. Uh, yes, so, yeah. so have I. Um, Pacing, which basically means if anybody here has a pacemaker, if your heart's beating too slow, we can pace your heart to speed it up. And again, it's also not very popular with people, but it saves lives. Um, we can't do that as a basic fire department. Defibrillation, we can do that with our AEDs. Um, what else? Uh, intravenous therapy, which is ba everybody, probably everybody knows what an IV is. As basic firefighters and as EMTs, we can't do that. We're not licensed to do it. As paramedics, we can do that, which means if your blood pressure's in a crapper, I can give you a fluid bolus and I can bring your pressure up to stabilize your blood, your blood pressure. If I have to give you medications, I can give you medications through your IV. Um, the intraosseous access is a, is a very interesting one. This is actually similar to the IV, but it's a, actually a steel catheter that we shoot into your bone. It goes into your leg or into your, into your shoulder up here. Um, and I can give you medication, or ALS can give you medications that way. Um, again, that's something we can't do as, basic fire, uh, as a basic fire department. Uh, the medications, <clears throat> we have certain medications as basic EMTs. Uh, I can give you epinephrine. If you're having an allergic reaction, if you're having trouble breathing, I can give you ep epinephrine. If you overdose on an opiate, I can give you Narcan. We can do that as ALS too, but that's the stuff we can do as basics. Uh, and then other ALS procedures, really awesome stuff, like I can put a needle in your, in your lung and reinflate your lung if you have a collapsed lung. We can't do that as basics. I can cut a hole and do that as basics. I've never got a chance to do that. It sounds pretty awesome, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I've never got a chance to do it. Not but that we want to do that. It's not that we want to, but if you've got somebody with an obstructed airway, we, as a basic fire department, we really can't do anything other than CPR and try to get it out of your, air, out of your airway. Okay. Next slide. As the uh, first uh, line on that slide says, can you go back for just a second? Oh, sorry. ALS brings the emergency room to your living room. You're going to get the same procedures that you're going to get in the emergency room in your living room because advanced life support can provide those services. Um, that's 
kind of what we're identifying as one of our future goals and we need to lean that way. As the run volumes increase, as everything else increases uh, for other communities and, and for the private ambulance company, we can't rely on them to be able to provide the service. Uh, we're currently collecting data right now to justify our numbers to, to make sure we're on the right path. Uh, I'm confident that once <coughs> we're done with the whole study over the next year or so, we should have a pretty good feel for it. So our, our one to three year plan right now is to improve, improve our EMS transport capability. Currently, as Lieutenant Baum said, we're currently BLS basic life support. Uh, we'd like to bring it up to advanced life support process. Uh, advanced life support capabilities. Bleh. Next slide, please. Um, our three to five year plan, uh, once we get the stations built, uh, we'd like to staff both stations. Again, going back to the original discussion or the original comment that I made earlier, if we go out on a medical run and a fire house fire comes in while we're out on the medical and we're in an ambulance, we're not really doing much good. If we're able to both staff both stations, if the ambulance run comes in on the east, the east station goes with an ambulance, the west station comes with an engine. If it goes out on the west, east west station goes with an ambulance, east station comes with an engine. Um, and plus you have four people on duty every day to provide the two and two out requirements of MIOSHA. Um, uh, my OSHA standards for, for uh, entering ideal H environments. Um, the three to five year plan would include the hiring of full time staff. Uh, currently, we're having a we have to be cautious on how many hours our staff can work right now because they're capped at 30 hours a week. Um, if we're staffing two stations, there's no way we could staff that with 34 employees and we'd be there to work three, uh, 30 hours a week. So this, the three to five year plan would include some full-time staff and provide fire-based EMS. The EMS revenue is created from ALS transport would be used to help offset or assist the additional funding required for the full-time staff. Rick? Uh, Gary, you wanna just- This, this is just a, a breakdown by, by year of where we would like to be. <coughs> um, Obviously, all this is interchangeable. It's going to depend on manpower. It's going to uh, our personnel. It's going to depend on um, money. Over here in 2019, we have uh, build new stations. So <laughs> that's what we'd like to accomplish by 2020. Collecting data, transporting BLS as needed when um, ALS units aren't available, and um, possibly we've been throwing around an idea uh, an idea about a different type of. Um, right now we have uh, tones that go off <clears throat> that let us know when we have a call. So our pager will go off, we'll respond to the call or to the station or, or whatever we need to do. We've been kind of uh, talking about doing a call the station tone where the people at the station that are on duty would get the tones and then whatever station area that call is in, that station would get the tones too. Can I add a little bit to that? Sure. Uh, the reason we're looking at changing our toning system, we do have some tones that are called duty tones. We're just the duty crew, the two people on duty, get notified of an incident, they respond out to the scene. We use that for um, open burning or burning complaints. We use that for uh, trees down, uh, occasionally wires down. But generally, we, we set out all tones, or set, we put out what's called an all tone. We have a piece of the township's pie that piece of the township's pie has to be utilized fiscally responsibly to make sure that at the end of the year we're still in the black. Um, as we progress, as we develop, as we morph into the next generation Highland Township Fire Service, we need to make sure that we have those monies to do that. So that's why we're looking at station tunnels. That's why we're looking at changing some of our procedures and some, a few of the other things that Gary's going to talk about in a minute. Um, when it talks about transporting BLS patients <coughs> when necessary, uh, we, we just put out a directive not too long ago that if STARS coming from 59 and Airport, which is uh, Waterford, that means STARS getting their butt kicks that, kicked that day or they're just short staffed. So if we have a, a BLS incident in our township 
our duty crew is going to transport that person. That frees up that ALS call. So if the neighbor of the person that was BLS has a heart attack, uh, falls off the roof, whatever, that ALS unit is still available. So we're already doing a, some of the stuff. We're, we're, we're in the preliminary steps of implementing some of this stuff. But uh, as we move forward, and Lieutenant Bonham will explain the rest of them. Um, <coughs> can everybody read this? I don't know if you guys can see it way back there or not. It's pretty self-explanatory. I don't, I don't really need to, everybody knows what a timeline is. So basically, this is where we are now. This is where we want to be in five years. That's supposed to be a five. Five 24-7 duty personnel per day and then transporting all ALS. The rest in between, it can be, I mean, you know, this can be moved here or it can be moved here or pushed back here. It, it, it's all gonna, it's pending finances and personnel. That's pretty much that whole mess there. I think what you might want to explain is the, the revenue difference between what the way it is now and what you're looking at and where that revenue comes from. Um, currently, because we have a private ambulance company in our community, when they transport, they'll send you a bill from the ambulance company for the services they, they provide. If we were to take over, and, and we do bill for BLS services right now, if we were to take over ALS um, services for our community, we would be able to bill the insurance companies just like the ambulance companies um, bill. Fortunately, being a municipality, we don't have to worry about uh, revenues and, and making money for our stockholders. All we have to do is break even. We are a service. We are your service. So our, our what we would provide to the community would, would, in my opinion, be a benefit because if, if there's any issues, uh, low income, uh, inability to pay, we would be able to garner, garner the, the bills compared to just sending you to collections. Uh, Again, Star EMS provides an amazing service. They do it at a reasonable cost. They don't charge us in the township anything for having their ambulance in our town. I can't tell you how much I appreciate Bill Grubb and his crews for what they provide for us. But again, as time goes on, as runs, run numbers increase, as everything um, increases, are we gonna lose the current service that we enjoy right now? Are we going to have to morph into more of a trend? more of a primary transport agency. Yes. Ken, would that involve buying the EMS? Would we, would we already have ambulances right now. We'd have to upgrade some of our equipment. We'd have to buy the cardiac monitors that uh, Lieutenant Bonham was discussing. We'd have to stock needles, IV supplies. Um, Oakland County provides a, a med box, all the drugs that, we're allowed, that we would be allowed to use as an advanced life support agency would come in the med box and there's certain protocols and procedures that we have to follow. Um, it would cost a little more on increase of uh, liability insurance through the state. It would cost a little more for our, our state licensing. Um, but until we get the until we get a, a better <coughs> grip of our statistics or our documentation, uh, some of the stuff that Lieutenant Bonham's putting together right now, we're not going to be able to say how much or ballpark how much we would be able to generate. Once we get these documents, these statistics over the next year or so, we'll be able to say, okay, 10% uh, of our ALS runs are, or 10% of our runs are ALS, and we can bill this. 90% are BLS, or 40% are ALS, 60% are BLS. We'll be able to put a number to the, the or we'll be able to put a cost to the number and, and make it a little more explainable for you. But that's what we're working on over the next year. Did you want to hit this last one? I think you kind of just hit them all. Right? Yeah, we sort of already did that. We, uh, yeah, this isn't anything to do with slide, but um, I mean, I know a lot of people that, that run EMS businesses. There's a lot of formulas to figure it out. Um, you, you guys, everybody will have, you'll have all the information you need before we want to do something like this. The last thing I want to do is put us or our township in a financial hole for something that's not absolutely necessary. Do I think ALS is necessary? Absolutely it's necessary. We, we, everybody should be ALS. Um, 
I'm gonna, I want to run a lot of numbers. There's a lot of research I want to do before we make a decision on something like that. So um, I don't want it, it to be a blindsided thing by any means. I want to be able to say, look here, this is what this is what we make. This is what we potentially will make. This is what we're doing right now. This is what we need to be at, so that everybody can see it. Not based on my words, based on our proof and our statistics. Mike, I want to just say real quick some of the benefits of fire-based EMS. Uh, our fire department's already on all EMS incidents. Um, ambulances will be dedicated to our township. Uh, they won't be doing dialysis transfers, uh, hospital to hospital transfers. It's just for emergencies, emergencies or calls for service in our township. Uh, transport revenue stays local to support the fire department operations. Patient services are provided by the fire department, which has a vested interest in our community. And the vested interest provides a customer-oriented service model to our citizens. With me saying that, don't think this star doesn't have a vested interest in this community because, as Lieutenant Bonham said, half the guys out of our Highland Station work for my department. They also work full-time for STAR. So they already have kind of a vested interest, but this is, instead of the company having a vested interest to its stockholders, it's the fire department having a vested interest to its citizens. Over the next, oops, over the next few years, we hope to prove this can all be accomplished with our current fiscal projections. Uh, can I answer any questions from the presentation? I have a question. Can I answer? Questions? Sure. You have to tell her where she's from. Um, Middle Road. Was Milford High School, did they have a bomb scare? And then did that involve your department? Um, I was not aware of any bomb scares. Where the phone calls were coming in, you know, across the nation. Oh, that was. A lot of different schools were being. And so I wondered if you were part of that uh, resolution. I was in Florida at the time. <laughs> no. I was in Florida at the time. I'm not really oh, sure. Okay, so I just, because I, I, I heard that Melford had gotten okay. a threat, and I didn't know how it was handled. So okay. I wondered if it was part of that. No. No? No, not, not Nigeria Valley School. Really? It did happen through uh, quite a few in uh, Oakland County, Orion, out in Orion, Pontiac, yes. out in Rochester. Yeah. And do we have something uh, in place for that? I mean, you're talking about <coughs> emergency. Um, uh, bomb is a police issue. We're for when the bomb goes off. The population really didn't increase between 2000 and now. Do you have any idea why the runs doubled? Uh, EMS. EMS says uh, we started running more and more EMS. Initially, it started out as just priority EMS calls, then we started running all EMS calls. Uh, and, and that's where we're at right now is running all EMS calls. A lot of the issue, too, is with the cost of health care nowadays, people use an ambulance for their primary care physician. They, they call the ambulance, they want to be transported to the hospital. Uh, we, we don't have the right say, uh, you're not getting transported. We have to provide a service or it's called abandonment. So that's part of the problem. And, and our community is not as... Um, Young as it once was. <laughs> Is that part of your statistics, Gary? Okay. Um, I am going to run demographics on Highland Township, on White Lake, Milford, North Oakland, all the surrounding communities to see how we compare to other townships, specifically townships that are providing ALS. And um, that's part of my plan to make sure that it's something that's viable for us. Well, what I'm looking at is if you make a run, Judy asked, why, is the run, why are the runs going up? Is it increasing in 18-year-olds, 40-year-olds? Well, we, don't, we, don't have, we don't track that. But I could tell a pretty interesting story. It would explain why, and especially in our community, why they'd be going up and what to anticipate, too. So, yes, ma'am. I was just wondering what the difference in salary is between fire, uh, the fire here in Highland and STAR, because we don't want to hear about a conflict of interest where you said so many of the fire staff work also for STAR. Currently we're a paid-on call system. When we transition to a combination, if we transition to a combination department in the future, uh, that'll have to be something that's determined at that time. <clears throat> so I, I 
can't give you a number because we don't have full-time staff at the fire department with the exception of myself and, and half of whoever the guy in the white shirt was. He's been with the news story. So were you anticipating you would make more working for Highland or more working for Star? I, I that will all depend on what the salaries are. Uh, but you can't just look at salaries. There's also benefits. There's also retirement and stuff like that. Um, it'll be a way to package when we get to that point. This is summary. To go to ALS, you already have an ambulance. Right? We already have an ambulance. We have three ambulances, actually. You have three ambulances. Yeah. One in each station. Well, to someone like me, you would need to do is train some people to, to the service, right? Or do you need more equipment, too? You Oh, you need Stand. a little bit of equipment. But Just a little bit of equipment, right? But when you say all you need to do is train a few people, yeah, it's a $5,500 course that takes two years. Mm -hmm. So it's not it just, years. it takes two years to become a, a, a paramedic. Um, do you have nobody trained already? Yes, we've got one, we have all star, people. six, seven. Star people, right? Well, we have star people, yes. So you could actually go out on the front and send those guys yeah. on that truck and go on those ones already. Yeah, well, you need, need full time. You need a bunch of people to come. I would have to pay them. the shifts. I would have to pay them, take them away people. from Star because right now Star collects the EMS yeah, truck. Yeah. I thought they were working for you too. They do work for me. They work part of eight on call for me. So, <coughs> okay. Star. so we do staff a Star rig in our and station. You would get an ALS guy at each station. Yes. To do service. Yes. It takes you five thousand dollars to train to be a camera. Five thousand dollars each time to train. Uh, clinical hours. Clinical rotations to the hospital, clinical rotations to the hospital. Where's Star Wilson? Pontiac. Pontiac. Yep. And you can say it. Yeah, they, they have a couple of ambulances located throughout the community or throughout the county. Somebody called for ALS service. Uh, they have to wait for the Pontiac or Pontiac. No, they have a rig in the island. They have two rigs in White Lake. They have Orient Township <laughs> rigs. They, they have rigs all over the place. They won't know if it's an ALS issue. Yeah, do you go to that issue to find out if it's an ALS or a basic? They they, they dispatch both of them. Yep. Wow. Okay. If it is ALS, I hate to cut everybody off. I really appreciate yeah. that you did ask the questions. Normally, I like to let people have that conversation. Uh, Chief, you did a great job there. Thank you. Um, Gary, excellent job. We're looking forward to more information. And uh, I can tell you from personal experience, I was an EMT back in the late 70s. The uh, amount of training you have to go through now to be uh, qualified for ALS is darn near doctor. And it's not an easy thing. You might pay $5,500, doesn't mean you'll pass. Uh, so it takes special skill sets, special people, special uh, thought process to be able to handle it. So. And just to add to that, if you're going to do EMS or paramedic stuff, you got to be a little not right upstairs. So. <laughs> What's your point? Well, you start, you started this. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Can I ask a question off subject a little bit for the chief? Okay. Do I out of order? Or? I no, I won't claim you're out of order. I, go ahead and ask, him, but we do need to move on. So. Okay, I, we just moved out here. We live on a lock drive off of Wood, uh, Woodrick. Excuse me, Lake. And I'm hearing different things about what I can do about building a bonfire down on my beach. Come out and get a copy of, you gotta get a burn, burn permit first. We'll give you a copy of the rules and outline everything on the uh, Where do I go to do that? fire station number one right here in Livingston. Right. Okay, that was an easy question. All right, we're going to move on to the, the, the next item. Um, for those who don't know, this is Sean Bell. He's our dual duty fire marshal ordinance officer, um, and he's going to uh, do a presentation for you. For us, um, Sean. Um, yeah, again, um, I'm Sean Bell. I'm your fire marshal, ordinance enforcement officer here in Highland Township. Uh, the reason that we wanted to do a presentation, and I, I cannot stand behind this, I walk and talk. And I was wanted to get to Gab, so I apologize if I ramble on. And I'm going to ask Mr. Hamill to please keep me on task and keep my slides moving forward because I will keep here all night. <laughs> so, um, and I think that's what, what, what kind of helps me. Uh, do my job is I, I, I can talk. Um, so basically my job and the reason I want to be here tonight to present this to you to the board is my job is a brand new position. 
it, it was a prototype position. Basically what they did is they had a part-time fire marshal and they had a part-time ordinance enforcement officer. Um, they decided to try a, this prototype position and put it, and combine the two jobs into one full-time position. So basically I'm doing two, two different jobs um, on a daily basis. Um, so it's been a year that I've been here and so I wanted to give them an update as far as this is what I do. This is what I've, I've built this position into. Um, when I started, I asked, what do, you, what do you want me to do? They're like, do whatever you want. Build, build it, build, build the program. That was awesome, I loved that, that was great. Um, I started, when I started the ordinance enforcement, I'm like, how do you do it? They're like, however you want. <laughs> um, I've had great people here in the building that have helped me, guided me, mentored me, um, and I think that we've built a really good team in, in doing these positions. So um, again, I just it's been a year, so I think that we owed it to the board to um, kind of give an update is here's what we've evolved into, and this is what we've built. So go to the next one. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. <laughs> oh, who remembers Fire Marshal Bill? <laughs> Living color. And living color. Fire Marshal Bill, Drew, uh, Jim Carrey. Um, I'm Fire Marshal Bell, so I, I wish I had a dollar for every time that I heard Fire Marshal Bell or Fire Marshal Bill. I wouldn't be here tonight. I'd be <coughs> rich. Um, anyways, my goals when I started here, I decided I wanted to have build goals for this position. And so I really thought and I sat down and I looked and combined the two positions. Um, provide a clean, safe living environment within the high, township of Highlands. And I kind of went uh, clean was for the ordinance side and safe was for the fire side. Um, they're both, we have fire ordinances, we have fire codes which are adopted ordinances of Highland Township. So it was really nice and it was a really easy transition to be able to blend the two jobs together because we're all basically, even on the fire side, we're enforcing codes, we're enforcing ordinances. Um, on the fire, on, this is basically a, a little bit of a overview of some things I'm gonna to touch on here. Um, fire inspections and plan reviews, fire prevention, public education programs, incident pre-planning, I'll explain all this, fire cause and origin investigations, working with the sheriff, um, community risk reduction, some problems that we found. James, wherever you want to. He left. He left. I was going to give him some kudos, but uh, <laughs> um, James has been instrumental in a couple of these programs and exactly what he pointed out. We, we have a problem. Here's an intersection. We have to identify those risks and work to try to resolve them. Um, so we found a few hazards in the in the township and we've re, we've worked to mitigate those hazards my job is just everybody thinks that a fire marshal you just go out and do inspections that's probably the farthest thing from the truth it's very in-depth it's very detailed it's very time consuming um, it really starts with plan reviews um, site plans building plans as plans come in I review them as well building department reviews them they go through zoning ordinances or zoning um, planning planning, zoning, they go, it goes through that whole process. I get involved with it, the building official gets involved with it. We look at the blueprints, we look at the plans. I make my changes um, or I approve them. If I have concerns, uh, can my fire trucks make it around the backside of the building? Is there enough distance? Um, are the egress properly? Are they within the, the codes? Um, so I spend hours going through and looking at the blueprints, giving them my, um, my approval. Um, but that's on the building construction side, but this all kind of ties together and I'm going to use probably use Midwest Glass and Highland House as my examples in here because I have pictures of the Highland House in here. Um, but now there's also fire suppression plans that come in. So when they sprinkle a building, Highland House, suppression system went in. Midwest Glass, there's a suppression system in there. They also submit blueprints and we have to review those. On large scale, as the board approved last, last, at the last month's meeting, they approved a, um, a fee schedule for these. We can now charge. Prior to me being here, they sent everything out to third party for third party review. Sprinkler plans, they would send them out to a third party review. That third party reviewer would charge a cost for that and submit it, and, and then they would submit it to the contractor. Now that I'm here, I can review these and I can charge, or the township now can charge, and recapture some of that lost money that was being given away. Um, so it, again, I do, will do, um, I talk so fast I get out of breath. <laughs> so I will review the plans, um, but these also require a lot of multi, um, multiple on-site inspections, a lot of flushing of undergrounds, um, hydro tests, pump tests, um, in the, these for just, and we're just talking sprinkler systems right now. Um, so there's actually a lot that goes into these. This is the pump over at the Highland House. 
This is part of their suppression system. This is their suppression pump for the, that runs their sprinkler systems. Underneath, inside of this building, underneath that red plate on the floor and underneath this building is a 45,000 gallon water tank. That was something interesting to me when I started here because I came from a hydrated community. I came out here, I'm like, where's the FTC, the Fire Department Connection? And they all started laughing at me. They go, it's that 45,000 gallon tank in the ground out there. Mm. Oh, <laughs> so again, now these are also things as I go out, this all has to be looked at, planned, planned, reviewed, inspected, tested. Highland House, I probably had, I don't even know how many hours invested in going out there. How many, probably 25 trips out there for inspections, meeting contractors, going over things, witnessing their tests, doing the churn tests on these pumps, making sure the pumps run, making sure that they all work, make sure that everything um, goes hand in, you know, they all, they're all intertwined, in intricate parts in these systems. That box in the back is the brains that runs that pump. Um, this thing needs to be tested annually, um, ran monthly. Um, this is the fire alarm system. Again, these are all separate plans that are also submitted. Um, they, su they do the drawings, the engineers do, or architects do the drawings. They submit them in, we look at them, we review them. Each one of those, is, that's basically a smoke heat detector. We have to test them. We go through these buildings and we pull those pull boxes. We, hit, we test these smoke detectors. We set them off um, with fake smoke and we test these entire systems. Again, these not only plan reviews, we go out, we do the inspections on them, and we go out and we do the, um, the testing on them. This again over is, is the Highland House. That's their alarm panel. Um, that's the, again the brains behind their fire alarm system. And now there's also special hazard systems. Again, over at Highland House, now this is, I just pulled off the computer, that's not Highland House. Um, but there's actually two different systems in here that again, plans are submitted, they're reviewed, we go out and we, we look at them, we test them, we inspect them to make sure that they're compliant and they work. There's a vent fan up there, you see the vents. That is inspected and has to be inspected by Italy. And then there's the pipes you see sticking down, that's the actual suppression system. So after we go out and we do all, all those inspections, um, this is something that I think is really important and something new that I brought to the, um, to the fire department and to the community is I, Chief, Chief Jackman gets tired of me saying this is the first time a firefighter goes into a building to not be the day that it's on fire. So our guys don't have the luxury to be able to go out and get into a lot of these buildings. So what I do is when I go out and I do an, a fire inspection is I try and take, this is just an example. There's many, many slides when I put these presentations together and then I send them over to the guys in the fire department to review. But there's a lot of things in here. I, this is called a pre-plan. This is the clubhouse over at um, Crestwick, the golf course over there. There's a lot of things that they really need to be aware of. We've got a hydrant over here, a hydrant over here. They gotta know where the hydrants are. And that's where I was gonna, oh, there you are. James has been really instrumental in our hydrant um, program um, that he's created. It's a great program we'll talk about here in a second. But there's a lot of things up here that they need to be aware of. These are all HVAC units. These things are heavy. They're all sitting up on top of the roof. They need to know, know the location of those, where they're at in those buildings. So if something catastrophic was to happen in this building, they need to know where those are located. My goal you'll see in the future is to bring these right into the fire truck. I want to put these on laptops and bring right into the fire truck so the incident commander can actually open up a tablet and have this picture in the fire truck and look and he'll know exactly where those HVAC units are, um, where the FDC, there's a fire department connection. This is a partially sprinkled building. Um, you can go to the next one. This again is a, a, th this is a multi-slide presentation that I send over to these guys to, to review for their pre-plans. This is just showing where the alarm panel is, where the knocks box, there's a box on the side of the building that contains the keys to the building. It's a lot cheaper for them to spend 300 bucks for a knocks box, yep, right there, um, than it is to smash out a $3,000 window just because an alarm's going off. Um, we can just open up the key, take that key out of there, and go in and access the building and see if there's any issues. I have a little note on that uh, about the Knox box in the library had errant um, alarms that go off all the time. And I, was, this was back before I became a supervisor, and it was always like at two thirty one or two thirty two in the morning, and when I'd, I'd get a phone call from Oregon from the the uh, monitoring company, and it turned out that. It was a flying squirrel <laughs> in the building, but the fire department would come over, and you, you don't want them blasting the window out because it, it's put setting off an alarm, and that's part of what that Knox box does. We then put a Knox box on the building so they have access to the front doors without wrecking everything. So, 
And we are requiring all all new construction in the township. It's in our fire code now that we are requiring that all new construction have knock boxes. I'm strongly I'm working with strip malls um, and owners. This is uh, Spring was it Spring Valley, uh, Duck Lake at 59. Yep. Um, that strip mall right there. Um, again, I went and did the inspired inspection on that strip mall and noted that they had a knock box in a bad location and all the keys for the other building were on the wrong place. So anyways, working with the building owner, I was able to get, I can, and he was really great to work with, convinced him that we needed another, a second knock box. Um, so now we, working with businesses, business owners, um, convincing existing ones that they're a good idea to have. And most people are really good to work with and they go ahead and just do them. Um, but some of the things that I also brought to the community here that I thought was a great idea, is I started is this is the back of the building and you start walking if, if there's something going on in this building at night or whenever and when our firefighters are trying to breach these doors this one across here I don't know if you can see the four bolts they put a bar across there at night they put a big bar across it so that door is not that, you can try to beat on that thing all day long you're not getting in that door so I don't want my guys wasting time so I still it on there bolted pretty simple right but at least those guys see bolted they know that there's a bolt and there's a deadlock and there's something to prevent them from defeating that door this one here, I stenciled on the back of the block. Because you know what, you open that door, you know what you're gonna find? You're gonna find a wall. There's, there's nothing there, it's a wall. <laughs> so if you think that you're trying to get into this part here and you're trying to get into that, but you open this up, there's a wall there. So especially in the event that there's a problem with one of our firefighters are in trouble, we don't need to be wasting time trying to breach doors with that we find on our walls on the other side of them. The other thing that we do is, this was Fire Prevention Month this year, or last year I guess. Um, October's Fire Prevention Month. The firefighters and myself, we go out to the uh, schools. And we did, however, we did all the schools in Highland. Um, we were able to contact 466 children, 167 adults, for a total of 633 fire safety contacts. Um, going out and working in the schools is, 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 is so cool. The kids are fun to work with. I, I enjoy doing it. I've been doing it for years. Um, so that's just another aspect of the job. Fire cause and origin investigation. I've been to the Michigan State Police um, Fire Investigation School. Um, we work right now in conjunction. Prior to my coming here, every, all the fire investigation was done through the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office has what, Matt? Three, three, uh, three, three fire right now, but it's positioned for four. Yeah, um, and that's for all of Oakland County. Those guys are busy. They are absolutely busy. So what we're trying to do is take a little bit of the work off of them and I'm gonna start working in conjunction with the, the sheriff's office. If they don't need to be called out, we'll handle it ourselves. If I get there and realize that there might be some criminal intent or whatever, or it's a pretty good size of death, things like that, definitely the sheriff's gonna be brought in and to, to help with the scene. Um, but the little stuff that they don't need to waste their time on, we're gonna take care of it in-house now. Um, hazard mitigation, community risk reduction. Um, again, like James has, had mentioned the light, that's kind of where this came into. But then what I also found is if you go to the next one, one of the first projects I came across when I came here is up in the top left corner, that orange bag. That's a fire hydrant right up on Milford Road. Chief Chapman told me, he says, that hydrant's been out of service for three years. I about fell over. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, nobody's fixed it. Well, it took me about a month, two months, I guess, I don't know, working with different departments here in the township. Um, Try, and I built a great relationship uh, right out of the gate with um, the Water Resource Commission up here in Oakland County. Um, started learning their process and found, tracked down who was responsible for this hydrant. Nobody knew. Nobody knew who, who, who was responsible for it. So through a little detective work, leg work, and hustling, I found out who was responsible for it. Long and short of it is that hydrant is now back in service and now they're all under a maintenance program. Um, so I was pretty proud to get that thing finally squared away. These other ones uh, down the two bottom left corners down here, work with the Water Resource Committee or Senate or whatever they are. Um, this is before. This is down in a, kind of a valley. Army Lake and yeah. Army Lake and Warlow. Warlow. <laughs> um, Same intersection. It's it's you can kind it's of hardly see that hydrant down in there. Fire code it's requires that the, the center barrel of that fire hydrant be 15 inches off the ground. In the winter time, that thing's buried in snow. You'd never see it. It sits sat too low. You can hardly connect to it. So we, get, we were able to work with the commission, the Water Resource Commission. They raised, they came out. They raised it, and I believe it actually is flagged now, so you can see it down below. And when the weeds grow up, these two here, these two hydrants here, they were well hydrants. 
Nobody even knew what they were. Nobody even knew that they existed. Again, working with uh, um, with Beth over here, the, the township's engineer. Um, working with her, we pulled blueprints out. We started digging through them, looking at them. Found out that in it turned out that these hydrants don't even work. Chief and I went out to go play with them, to run them, to, to flush them. Wouldn't even come on. So we got in contact with the Homeowners Association. To try to make a long story short, we got in touch with the Homeowners Association, worked with them, worked in conjunction with them, um, explained to them that they don't work. And you're, you, so anyways, they actually, now they're functioning. And we have taken out the fire department. We go out and we will um, exercise them two times a year, not only for to keep them operational, but also to keep our guys um, trained on them and so they know where they're at and how to work them. Yeah, the difference sure. in these is that they're actually wells. They're not connected to a, a full system, so they have their own pump, and the pump just sits there and doesn't work. Eventually, corrodes up. Let's turn it on, just blows a fuse. So that's. Can I just add real quick? Sure. Uh, this is Paramount Fire Department. It's a paint and call system as a rural area. Less than 25% of our community is covered by a municipal water system or a private water system. So anytime the hydrant's out of service, that's just amplified or amplifies our, our risk or our hazards for operating a fire scene. So we need to make sure all these things are operational, are locatable. Uh, again, James did a great job. We have a little app on our phones that alerts us for alarms. If we open the uh, map on the uh, alarm and it's for a structure fire, I can tell you off that app, because James put it in there, where that hydrant, the nearest hydrant is at. And it's good to within a few feet. Uh, within 30 feet. Okay. Get you in the area. So, and again, that's where I was going to give James the kudos out because he worked really diligently, and I and I, I commend him for stepping up. Because when I started finding all these issues, James was blowing my phone up, going, "Here's one here, here's one there, here's one there." And so I I, I kind of take the approach to where I I don't take credit for this stuff. I give the credit to everybody else, but I also want to give credit to everybody else who jumps on my team. And I think we've built a team. Um, I work with the building department. I work with. Um, zoning. I work with everybody in the dump. I mean, how many times, Judy, have I been down in your office, and Tammy, how, how many have I been in your office? I mean, if I think that somebody can provide or be a resource, I'm all over it. I mean, and I, I th I'm kind of proud that we. I think we've built a really nice team together um, to get some of these problems resolved. So, anyways, enough on the, the the other one up at the top right corner is these are we, these are very deceiving. They look like fire hydrants, they were, this is Midwest Glass. Again, when we go back to the plan reviews that I did, the sites and everything else visits, so I found these, I'm like, what are these? Nobody knows. But they look like fire hydrants, that post right there says fire, um, fire lane, don't park, whatever. So through this process that they're still working on these, I've, I've made them through that review, remove these two things so they get these two hydrants so they can never be mistaken as fire hydrants because they're not, nobody knows what they are. But they look like fire hydrants. So next. Um, a couple other things that I kind of approach, it. again, I, I kind of sometimes stick my nose where it doesn't belong, but I, again, on the community risk <coughs> reduction, um, this was a hole down at Giddings, uh, on Giddings Street, or Boulevard. Um, you go to the next one, you'll see the hole better. That's our fire truck trying to go, going to start going through the hole, the next one. And where is that? On Giddings. Which is north of, uh, uh, up at Duck Lake Road, north of White Lake. And the interesting thing about this is, is that the individuals on the road it's a private road um, they wanted to find some way they wanted to shut the road off because they the people on the street were supposed to all pay to help maintain the road and they couldn't get half the people to, to pony up so uh, it became a, an issue some people wanted the hole because it slowed things down uh, we tried to find what you know the key thing is no you don't shut a street off because it didn't it could uh, impede uh, safety. So that's how it kind of got tossed to the fire department. Uh, what can we do? And then this is just a, an awesome way of looking at it. Well, this, and, and so when I saw this hole, I about I couldn't believe it. I'm like, why isn't this fixed? Well, I found out that it's on a private road. Well, we don't have the ability. The county's not going to come take care of this. So again, working with the various departments here that we have available to us, um, I, I educated myself. I went through and read the private road agreements and things like that. Um, God, Spent and pulled Karen and, um, in, out of Rick's office, and, and she got me the names and the addresses. Work again, working with planning and zoning. Um, found, they were drafted up a letter and mailed it out to the to the residents and said, "Look, here's the issue. It's impeding your, possibly your safety. 
we have to have two ways in and two ways out. We have to be able to, we can't block off a road with a fire truck and not have the ability to bring water because you're not a hydrogen area. We gotta be able to get water in there. Um, but here's the next problem that I was really concerned with as well. Now this is, a fire, this is our fire truck. See that exhaust system right, blue, right here? This is the exhaust system of our fire truck. This is the clearance was about that, that much, about two inches. I tried taking a picture of it with tape measure, but it didn't come up. Um, that, that, that exhaust system on a brand new 600 and some thousand dollar, I know the chief knows it down to the penny, that's, that's a $10,000 stainless steel exhaust system. And that's, not, that's just the exhaust, that's not even including the labor to re repair or replace it. So it was an issue. I was, I was really concerned with two things. Blocking off the road because of that hole, or getting stuck in that, or dropping an ambulance, or whatever into the, you know if it freezes over, it was an issue. So we got you know what it's fixed. They all got together. We worked with the neighbor, the neighborhood. That road's filled in. It, it's a, it's super smooth now. That hole's gone. So I was pretty proud of that one. This is my next. Uh, this is next on my hit list. That's at Hickory and Oak, um, Oakland Drive. If you take you look at the next picture there. That's that's the road. That's my fire, our fire truck trying to get around there. You, we can't. It's never been a road. Well, there's houses and we got to be able to get down it. Um, again, it's a private road, so I've got to I've got to get on this one to try to get these neighbors in this area to do something because we cannot get a fire truck down there. And, and here's one of the other issues to it too: is if we identify a problem that we can't make access to a property, and we know and we let you know. If you have an issue at your house, whether it's a structure fire or, or anything where you need service, or if we damage our truck getting into your property, you're liable for it. It's your responsibility to maintain it, you're liable for it. The scary part is if you did have a structure fire in the house, and we've sent you notices that we can't make access to your house because the, the clearance isn't wide enough on the, the drive coming up to your house, or you've got a small man-made lake on your drive coming in, <laughs> the insurance isn't going to cover your your, your uh, claim, and if they find out about it beforehand, they may drive it to the insurance carrier. So that's not what we want to do. We want to make sure that everybody's protected, everybody's as safe as possible, but we need your help to do it. Now, the other thing, too, about these is, as I identify these, most of our firefighters know about these issues. Um, they're aware. They live in the community. But they may not be aware of them. So what I do is when I come across things that I find in my travels through the ordinance side of it, um, I email it out to the firefighters. I'm like, hey, look, here's an issue here. Be aware of it. This was one that I found just being nosy driving around on an ordinance complaint. Um, when I was kind of new to the township, I had to drive it and learn it. So I would drive around and I'd go, hey, I wonder where this road goes. <laughs> yeah, so I got lost a lot. Um, I'd come back for hours later, they'd be like, where are you going? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, that's how I learned. Um, but anyways, this one here was a unique, a, a unique situation. Again, like when I find these, I send them out to the firefighters. Again, they need to know it's good for the community, it's good for the firefighters, it's good for the resident. This is over on Pepper Trail. Um, if you could, This house here has a Chevron address, this house here has a Pepper Trail address. So if you come up here off of Pepper Trail, which is where you're going to get it, you come down here, what are you going to find? You're finding this gate. So this is, this is, this is going to take time to get past. It's, a, it's, it's, it's blocking the road. If they're allowed to do it, it's their driveway, it's their road. So what I blacked out here, because I knew that this was going to be seen, is that's the directions on how to defeat that gate. So I blacked it out so it wasn't public knowledge. Um, but again, so after, like, these are just one of these things that when I find them, I send them over to the firefighters so they're aware of it. So now they know if they have to go to Pepper Trail. And I've had communication with this property owner. We're going to try to get their information put into the sheriff's. Because if the sheriff has to go there, they need to know how to get to open that gate too. If the SAR ambulance goes and gets there before us, they need to know how to get into that gate. Um, and then they'll drive off a of Chevron. That, that, drive in, that turn into that driveway. Good luck getting that big fire truck around that corner. I, don't, I hope we don't ever have to because you'll probably drop it in the ditch. Um, but that's just the way it is. So that's kind of some of the things that I've done. I do, I've accomplished working again with everybody here in this building, bringing us all together under one umbrella, tried to accomplish a, a lot of good for the community. So now this is the ordinance side of it. Um, that's my monthly report. You can't really see it. The council gets my monthly report every month. Um, that, and it's the number of ordinance violations that we do. And I wanted to, and I put this in because I want to explain this because it drives me nuts. <laughs> Lisa shaking her head, she gets it. This number down here, this is total cases for December, total cases to date. 
So we ended out the year with 285 ordinance violations. Keep in mind, I was new, so I had a big learning curve in there. Um, last year, they had 251, so we were up a little bit. But you also look here, last year they had 24 cases, new cases in November, and we only had 14 last month. But these numbers are very deceiving because those are new cases. Those are complaints that we've received. That doesn't mean, that you still gotta remember is that's one complaint. That's the complaint that I enter in the computer. It doesn't count the, the follow-ups that go up, that go on. So that should be 28, not 14. Um, now, and I have to go out multiple times to follow up on it, send out letters, make phone calls, they call, they come in, they whatever. There's so much time spent on this stuff <coughs> that this, this number, when you just look at it and go, there's only 14, you have to understand. It's just, like, it's just like the fire inspection side of it. There's so much behind the scenes that goes on that that's why I'm trying to explain it, to, let you, to justify the, what this is all about and what goes on. And then now the 14, we're still, I, I'm still working on, in January, I'm still working on December's and some of them from November because not everything is an easy fix. You have to work with people. Some of the complaints that I go out on, um, just to give you a quick overview of some of the complaints, weed and grass complaints, those numbers skyrocket in the summer. That, 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 that report you see, it gets crazy in the summer. I mean, I can drive from house to house to house to house. It's nuts um, on grass complaints. Some of the other ones are in, um, unlicensed and inoperable, in, uh, inoperable vehicles, blight, um, and animal complaints. Yeah, isn't that dog cute in the middle? Yes. He's mine. <laughs> yeah, that's my dog. I, I thought it was a cute picture, so I threw him in. And then I thought the horse and the chick were kind of cool looking, too. So they're not my horses and chickens, though. Um, a lot of the animal complaints is, you know, dogs wandering off in the neighbor's yards. The neighbors let their dogs roam around. You know, the neighbor's dog is doing, you know, in the top right-hand corner in somebody's yard. And, yes, I get those phone calls and have to go over and re resolve the issues. Um, so, and again, here's another uh, multi-department task, I guess, that we, we've accomplished that I was pretty proud of. Um, working with the building department and as a fire code and as an ordinance, um, we tackled this, this, these, issues, these next couple slides together as a team. Um, again, I like to take the team approach. I bring everybody together. But here's this house afterwards. That house we kept finding open. So under the fire marshal, I went and I, I deemed it an unsecured structure, worked with the building official, and we deemed it an unsecured structure. Multiple, multiple, multiple phone calls to the bank. It was in foreclosure. Letters sent. We finally, next thing you know, it's, it's, this is what it's looking like now. And this was just a week ago. So we've made progress. Here's another one that we found. Um, just again, on an ordinance complaint, driving by, find, find, found it unsecured. Come to find out the owner had passed away. It was a, a relative in Cal uh, California. Um, ended up with the property. So we reached out to them and said, hey, we got to get something happening on this house. They were great people, came in, filled out their permits, worked with the building department, and that was last week that that house has now been sold and being renovated as well. So we're trying to bring a value, and you know, the one thing that I recently in a, oh, here's my, <laughs> snatch the size off 59. Now this is something I, I absolutely despise doing. It's dangerous because you know, people don't stop for you, but I'll tell you what, I'm pretty proud because if you go from Heartland to White Lake, you don't see no signs. But you go to those communities, there's signs everywhere. <laughs> so we, we spent a lot of time plucking signs off of um, and off the internet. Signs. Signs. Political signs, everything from garage, we, sales. <coughs> garage sales. We, you know, you know, the garage sales I try to be a little flexible it's on because people put them out and they tape them. They, you know, but you know, we asphalt whatever or oh, mattress yeah. king and. <laughs> Um, Paintings yeah, you name it. So, There's all kinds. So we should see you out there. It is me. It is me that goes out nice. there and steals them. Yes. Um, and then the political signs, we pick them up as well, and um, whatever. So again, there's, if there are some that are out there as a portable sign that at, uh, interfere with sight lines for automobiles pulling out, then that's something that you would mm -hmm. be. Uh, yep. Yeah. There's there actually is an ordinance again, Lisa. Lisa. Um, taught me everything I know about yanking signs. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's ordinances that cover signs and where, how, where they can and can't be and how far off the road they have to be. Um, re restricting visibility of intersections, driveways, and things like that, yes. Um, so basically, what I've, as, as I've kind of said a few times, is I've, I've, I, I look at it as I've built, 
I'm trying to continue to work on building a cohesive working relationship with all the departments of building, planning, zoning, ordinance enforcement, fire marshal, the fire department, and all the other township employees. And I basically look at it as we're forming a community resource department is what we're doing. We are a resource for the community. If you guys have any questions, we can pretty much answer them all in a you know, one-stop shop. My goals for uh, my goals for 2019, because now we're here and moving forward, I've got a year under my belt, and I think we've made some pretty good progress. I'm really proud of. Um, so I'd like to continue, or I'd like to start a business registration program. Um, actually, I got a question for you: How many businesses are in Highland Township? I know, but I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody really knows. Um, and uh, but that also brings another problem: is there's businesses that are coming into our community that slip under the radar. And we need to know that for the fire department. I want to know what kind of products and commodities that they have going in. So if we have businesses require businesses to register, we know that they're coming in. There is a system in place, um, but people come and go. I want to know. We need to know that they're coming. They might. They might just bypass Township Hall and go open up business somewhere. We don't know that. A um, simple. A simple example of that is. Um, what happens, they'll come in and they'll go to one department, and it might be Lisa that they have to see because they're starting a new, uh, or exchanging one business in a building for another, and it could be in a strip mall. And the perfect example of this one is, is there's a Sherwin-Williams, is it, uh, or a paint I store that has opened up, and uh, it turns out we didn't know about it, and it's, it's kind of one of these things, well, it seems innocuous, you got one business goes into a strip mall and doesn't really have to do a whole lot to modify it, so it seems like a simple thing. Well, paint stores are a bomb waiting to explode. That's why it's important that we have these kind of interactions where everybody is made aware. So this is where Sean is heading with this. So. Um, the, ne the next one, the, my next vision, or what I'd like to do is I'd like to start a proactive rental inspection program. Um, doing the ordinances, I find that a lot of the ordinance complaints are rental properties. Again, I pose you the question, how many rentals do we have in Highland Township? Nobody knows. Um, I know that there's 500 and some um, non, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't want to say uh, non-homestead because there are some, but we don't know if those are cottages or whatever. So <coughs> again, we need to send letters out, identify those, and that's a whole other process. I'll be before the board here when we're ready to put that forward, asking permission to go forward with that program. And then it's going to take time to, to put together and implement. I've already done a lot of research on it. I have a lot of experience in it. I have a rental pro I have rental properties, so I'm very for it. I'm, I pay the cost to have these done on my own, and I, I'm 100%. I don't mind writing that check because it's an insurance policy for me as well. Um, but a lot of our ordinance, it gives us an, it's going to give us an opportunity to get in there and resolve a lot of health and safety issues in rental properties from slumlords, um, clean up ordinance side, get these, some of these rental properties cleaned up, um, which makes us a better, safer, more pleasant place to live. Um, I'd like to imp improve our fire inspection software. It's, it, there's a program out there where I'll be able to track things better. Um, we, over the last year, I know he's, he cringes every time I bring it up, because it costs money. Um, but it, we, we, we'll be able to track data. Um, we've tried two programs since I've been here. Again, we've been creating this program and this, this and putting it in place. So far, I haven't been 100% pleased because this next other program I know I've utilized in the past and it, it's going to be better for us. Um, and as Chief touched on in his presentation, is I'd like to form an emergency management program here. Um, January, or December 28, 2010 at 9.05 a.m. in the city of Wayne, Frank's Furniture Store blew up from a gas leak. I was there. Chief Chapman was there. Um, I ended up being the poor guy that had to run the scene. Um, I, the chief was out of town. I ended up being the incident commander. And typically, I was the emergency manager. And I would have been the one that was responsible to go open up our EOC. Well, I was now on scene as the incident manager. So I called my secretary, who just happened to be off that day. She was, it was her birthday, and her husband was buying her a car with a big bow on top of it. And um, so it trickled down to our part-time secretary, um, is the one who came and opened up our EOC and got it up and running and operational. Um, how she was able to do that was because we practiced, we practiced, and we practiced, and we trained on it. She came in, all the, all the um, board members, department heads all showed up, they all knew their roles. It's only because we trained them and we practiced it. We had quarterly practices, we did tabletops. So when that day that that incident happened, everybody knew their job, everybody showed up, 
and it ran smooth as silk. And it was, it, as bad as an incident as it was, it really ran well. Um, and we were actually recognized by the emergency management of Michigan for that incident um, on, on the smoothness that it, it ran. Um, so that's something that I'd like to bring in, um, kind of start working on over the next year and on into the future. The last one is I'd like to, is I'd like to implement a um, smoke detector and battery replacement program here in the township to where right now we don't have the money, so I'm, I'm gonna have to go out and find it um, through donations, whatever. But when people call and they have need smoke detectors put up, we'll go out and we'll put them up. If they need a battery replaced, we'll go out and we'll replace your batteries for you. Um, nobody should have a house, and I'm sure there are, and I, matter of fact, I know there are, there's houses here in the township that don't have working smoke detectors. Um, so basically, I'd like to continue to build a cooperative working relationship with all of our community departments and creating a community resource department or a one-stop shop for all of our residents, businesses, and, and visitors. I think that's it. Next. Any questions? <laughs> do you have any new residential uh, fire inspections? Do we? Yeah, do we? No. Is there plans to do it or something? Uh, well, again, I would love to. Um, you want to map of those on the home in your we, we do not have the authorization or the Probably authority to, to go into private residences at this time. Now, if we formulate a rental inspection program, we can. Yeah, an ordinance inspection. <laughs> I'm sorry? Didn't you have an ordinance for rent, rental and stuff like well, that? Well, that's, that's, my, that's my goal for this coming year. I want to start implementing <coughs> that. There's another, another idea that I have that I haven't mentioned yet is I would like to every time, it's called a certificate of occupancy or a CFO, every time that a, a, a property, a private residence property changes in ownership, that it be inspected and they get a certificate of occupancy and it's not allowed every time a home. A house, you know, we're, we've got older homes in our community here. Who knows how many Mickey Mouse homeowner lawyer jobs have gone on, plumbing jobs, towards if we have to. <laughs> we've all done it. <laughs> um, you know, if, if, if these homes are inspected, we send a building inspector, a fire inspector out to look at these homes prior to them as they're being sold as a transferring ownership. And some of these safety issues can be resolved. You can force to repair. Sure, they're not getting a certificate of occupancy. You gotta, it's got to be occupied with a certificate of occupancy. Because not everybody's going to get a private home inspector when they buy a house. They're expensive. Yeah. Is that mandatory right now or not? Uh -huh. No. So that's something that, that's, that, again, that's another one of my back pocket goals that I've got. Um, I would like to see it again. All it's doing is it's, it's increasing our property yeah, values. Sure. Yep. You charge for it, and that's your battery money. Well, we can charge for it. We can charge for it, but the, the and, and the thing is, we, we're not charging to make money. We're charging to offset the costs of having the inspectors go out and do that stuff. Well, not just me; it'd be the building department as well. Or we can. There's a whole. There's a whole. I've got a whole idea. A lot of people. I got a whole idea on how to do this, but if we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to get it implemented or start looking at it. Twenty twenty. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Question on the on the uh, idea of uh, periodically replacing smoke detectors. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've never seen the moving parts inside of a smoke detector to know what wears out. Actually, a smoke detector, if you, if you take your smoke detector down and you look on the back of it, there's a date. Mm -hmm. And they recommend that every 10 years that you replace the smoke detector. Right. Um, what wears out? The sensor that actually sensors. detects the uh, smoke. What, what is there in the sensor that's used, wearing out? It usually gets covered with some type of debris. Yeah, uh, from dust. sitting there, dust, dust. dust they just get old. Dark. Yeah, you know, it's cooking oils in the air, uh, any any moistures in the air, moistures creates oxidation, Corrosion. that creates uh, rough surfaces inside the detector. Um, it's not that it's not going to work; it's just not going to be as effective. As, depending on the type of detector it is, whether it's photo uh, electric or ionized detector, I mean, there's all kinds of everything has a surface light on it. Everything has just ambient air has particles and moisture and, and crap in it. Okay, as you, so. As you know inside your house as you're cooking. We, we got to go. Oh, sorry. Okay, I have to get out. We're all in here. Any other questions? Right, thank you for your time. I appreciate right. it. Thank you for your time. Can I just make one comment? What? Can I just make one real quick comment? Your three minutes is up. Yeah. Go ahead. What do you do? Uh, just since Sean's been over in Township Hall as a fire marshal slash ordinance officer, it, it's been a, a a benefit for our department, like you showed in the picture with the pre-plans and everything else. But more importantly is, is the communication that he's getting with the other departments in his area, the building department, the zoning department, uh, planning department. It allows us to know of, like Rick mentioned, the, the Benjamin Moore paint stores. 
we need to all work together so that we're all made aware of this kind of stuff and we get in there and do the inspections. Do they have five or 55 gallon drums of turpentine or paint remover, paint thinner? Um, just the, the communication and having them over there has been a complete success from the 2017 program that we developed. And this, this conversation is leading a little bit further than just what you heard here. The three of us have been working on the fact that we have one individual that we share. Um, there's no way that that position can maintain itself, especially as a fire marshal, as a split position. At some point in time, we know that it's gonna, they're going to need them full time as a fire marshal. We also, when that happens, that means we have somebody on our side that we're going to have to replace. Uh, what we're doing is looking at how does that individual interplay in the way that the entire business operation is within this environment. And what Sean has brought to the table is some concepts that really make you think about a different way of approaching what is the value and what is the need for that position and how could it actually affect the management of, the, of the, that entire department, the whole building operation, the whole planning operation. So it's a position that is not just let's find somebody that's willing to go around and pull signs and do the standard stuff that we've done in the past. Not that that's a brainless job, but it's, there's a lot more to it than that that could add a lot of value to the community. So that's uh, there's more today that you'll be uh, will be relating to the, about that position. So I just want everybody to know that there's changes that are going to occur in the department. Some of them are from attrition. Uh, when that attrition occurs, then we're going to be looking at uh, how that how these positions affect each other and and what we're talking about is having that uh, community resource versus just oh there's the building department there's the planning department there's the you know and having that pass off we need to all be made more aware of what's happening all the time so there's systems that we got to develop those don't come with just the way we've done it in the past so uh, it's it's a new approach uh, it's something I think is a long time coming and we got really lucky by having our uh, the choice of the individual that we got actually was not the first choice it turned out to be a choice by a default and uh, not that he wasn't of value but he's actually uh, he was the guy I really preferred in the first uh, round but um, <clears throat> And it's proven that uh, his abilities and skills are, are there, and he's not just waiting for somebody to ask him what to do. And when he made the comments earlier about well, asking, um, what do I need to do? And like he didn't know what he was doing, he actually knew what he needed to do for ordinance. He wanted to know whether there was some special way that we did things. And we said, no, come up with some. You t show us how you're going to perform here. And I want to give you kudos, Sean, for the past year. You've done a phenomenal job. You handle things with a smile all the time that uh, give other people a hard way to go. And I think maybe uh, you and Lisa must have something in common where you can put up with the uh, stuff. I know it flusters you on occasion, but you always get flustered with a smile. And that, that, that adds value to the community a, a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you. And going forward, we're now going to have the fire department's meetings on their own night so that we can get our job done. And that's a joke. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> so, all right, thank you very much. So we're going to move on. Anybody, um, that was a long period of time. Does anybody need a couple minutes for anything? Okay, then we'll move along. Lisa, thank you very much. Thank you. And congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, next item is uh, pending business 9B. Um, we've been working on uh, our bus program, trying to work with uh, multiple communities to hopefully get the bus moved off into an authority style of a, an operation. Um, <clears throat> it's been moving to forward pretty well, and we're at a point where the requirement now is that uh, each of the communities um, give notice of intent to continue to uh, move forward with it. And this is not a, a commitment that we're going to spend any X dollars, but it's a commitment that says we're serious enough, and we have mentioned numbers in the past, um, that we're serious enough and believe that this is a, a program that uh, needs to happen this way. So on that, I'm going to um, make a motion to uh, 
And in your package, you have a, a resolution and to speed the process up. Uh, I move uh, that we approve resolution 19-03 regarding notice of intent and grants for West Oakland Transportation Authority. Support. So, Gary, should we add anything to that? Is that? No, that's sufficient. Okay. Uh, at a meeting of the group back in November, it was identified that it was going to, you know, to do a proper agreement, it was going to take several months. But it was also identified that it might be possible even before this organization was formed that grants that it could use upon formation <coughs> could be applied for. And this resolution serves that purpose as well. And uh, it would be used in grant applications, and as it says, in anticipation of this WOTA being formed. So. It's going to be presented to the different communities, you know, over the next month or so, I'm guessing. Yep. It may not look exactly like this one, but same concept. You know, we think we're, we think we're going to form this authority once we have a final agreement that everybody's in agreement with. Uh, pending that, do something that can hopefully uh, allow the grant process to start. Right rather than waiting for it to be formed, then applying for grants and having to wait the whatever time period it takes to find out if you get them. And currently the grant, uh, the main grant that uh, we're, is being considered is uh, through the Ralph C. Wilson Foundation. Um, they have multiple types of grants they use for community um, use. We fit, this program fits into that in two separate um, um, scenarios and it's a potentially a multi-million dollar uh, possibility um, so we're crossing our fingers that uh, we can make get the the best out of that and uh, the direct Kim the director has done a really good job of putting all the pieces together so uh, but can't move forward without uh, this type of a, an agreement that shows that intent because the grantor is not going to allow us to apply for it if we don't have the, the right formula for it. So it's been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion or? Good. All right, uh, vote please. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. 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 Motion carries. <clears throat> Now, when you said show at the mill 10C, did you mean 9C? 10C. Well, okay. So we're going to do it after the two fire, more fire department right. things. Sorry. <laughs> I'm being facetious because in the past, since we've gotten this new chief in the past, we really didn't have a lot of communication that came out of the fire department. <laughs> that was not on film, Gary, so we're going to... So, uh, it is proven to be of value to, we have a lot better understanding as a board of what our fire department's all about and uh, what we authorize in spending and stuff. So it's of uh, high value to get this type of information. <clears throat> okay, so uh, new business item 10A. Um, there's two different uh, um, motions uh, that have to be uh, dealt with here. Uh, one is from the fire department side. For fire marshal, and one is from the uh, ordinance officer side, and uh, so what happens is uh, I'll do the the first motion, and this is in relationship to the value added that uh, Mr. Bell, uh, Sean, our fire marshal slash ordinance officer, has contributed to uh, our community, and also knowing that moving forward we're going to load his plate pretty doggone heavy, and I had a conversation with him earlier today about you know, assistance. A lot of us have, I have a, an assistant and uh, the other two in-house officials have assistants. He's not going to get one. So that means he's got to play three parts. And so it's a lot of work. He does a great job at it. And so uh, I'd like to make the motion that we uh, make a budget amendment uh, to uh, line item 101-301-000. 801003, that's for accounting purposes. Mr. The, Hamill, I think that um, should be done second to the 
request for the increase in pay because if the increase in pay doesn't go oh. through, then we don't need the budget amendment. Correct. She's right. Okay. Thank you. Motion to increase his pay. I guess that's how you have to do that. Are we going to go with the Chiefs first? I can do that. Uh, in 2017, we created a shared position between the Township and the Fire Department. The shared position of Fire Marshal Ordinance Enforcement was filled in late 2017. This position was filled by Sean Bell. Fire Marshal Bell's previous experience in both areas of the position made him a valuable asset to our community. With his experience and the ability to communicate, Fire Marshal Bell has provided a bridge with all departments within our community. He has provided routine ordinance enforcement, viable information and resolution to, fire, to our fire staff, uh, identifying local hazards, limited water supplies, uh, private hydrants, areas access, area access, and passable roads, isolated addresses, building pre plans, which he showed you a couple in his presentation, fire code enforcement, including the expansion of the Knox Box system. Uh, he's also been in coordination. He's also been coordination with uh, building and building department on dangerous structures. Coordination with zoning department on enforcing zoning violations and the ability to work with residents and groups to achieve amicable resolutions to complaints, much like the roads that he outlined in his presentation. Team mentality and coordination of efforts is instrumental as our community grows. Fire Marshal Bell also maintains state certifications for fire cause and origin. The cer these, this certification will allow our department flexibility on structure fires. Currently, we contact Oakland County Sheriff's Office for assistance in determining the cause of fires. While the Sheriff's Office will still be utilized when a fire is determined to be suspicious or undetermined, the fire marshal will be utilized to determine the need for further, further investigations. Um, fire Marshal Bell's skills on top of his credentials are just a few of the desirable characteristics that make him a valuable asset to our community in an effort to continue our progress. I'd like to, to amend a 2019 budget and increase the salary of the positions by $6,000 shared by the township and the fire department. I would like to adjust my budget, 206 209 206 which is a line item for fire marshal from 20085 to 23085 with the hourly increase to take effect January 7th, 2019. The monies will be transferred from the unallocated fire fund balance. You guys use a different term for that, I apologize. Fire marshal will also be provided to a dedicated vehicle for responding to cause and origin determination when needed. One of the, the big issues with him do, helping with the cause and origin just to, to address this issue is, uh, as Lieutenant Snyder mentioned, there's three investigators for the whole county. Granted, they don't work in Southfield, they don't always work in Royal Oak, but they are called out for assistance in those areas. But there's 40 other communities or entities that they provide their services for. It's not uncommon for us to wait three to four months to get a fire report back that we attach to our Enfords report. That slows our process in closing out our Enfords report. When the idea was posed to Oakland County Sheriff's investigators at a, a recent investigation that they would have been called on regardless, um, you would have thought we were buying them donuts. <laughs> they were very happy with the idea. They, they appreciated the, the thought because that will take some of their workload off and streamline their process. We're still gonna have a great working relationship because we do have a, we will have the need for communication with them, but Upcoming SOG will, will kind of change our current practices from just calling them to uh, getting information from the fire marshal. So as his duties change for the fire department, as he's developed his position for the fire department as well as for the township, and <clears throat> I think this is a, a, a very uh, reasonable request on our part to justify the amount of work that he's actually putting in. So on that point, Gary, I think what I'd like to do is combine the two. There's two memos here. Um, I guess what the question would be, I'm making a motion to increase the uh, salary of the joint position, the combined position, by $6,000. That's fine. Shared by the township. And the fire department equally equally three thousand dollars each then the budget amendment would come next that's what you're saying mary yes okay so that's my motion support 
moved and supported. Uh, discussion or discussion? discussion after? No discussion. Okay. Um, you know, due to the presentation that he gave and everything, I think that um, he's done a wonderful job and really, really done a lot for the township and it's so appreciated. I just feel that that amount is a little bit inappropriate for one year and I think that uh, compared to other raises and things that for one year I feel that it's an inappropriate amount. So I'll be voting no on that. I just want to say that. <coughs> it's a dollar fifty-four an hour on our side. I'm just comparing it to other raises that other people are getting, you know, in the township. Well, and I don't know if it's clear to everyone. I mean, uh, and uh, you're, you know, that's I'm okay with your viewpoint, but um, the other raises that were granted, where everybody were more maintenance, you know, sort of cost of living kind of idea. They're staying in the same position with the same responsibilities. What's being discussed here is that um, this position is being increased in terms of responsibilities and programs that are being taken on it's um you know he's still the same person obviously mm -hmm. and still covering fire marshal and ordinance but bringing in these other safety programs and community resource programs is more the cause so it's you you know it's it's not the same as sort of somebody who's doing the same thing every year thank you Okay. Yes, sir. Has any consideration been giving, given to modifying what I'm sure is an existing job description? It will have to be done because it's definitely a different, it has not been done at this point. And my, just a question for Mary Pat, if, if, if that was part of this, that wasn't just a raise with no change in the formal job description, but rather there was an obvious and binding increase in job duties. Would that have any bearing on your view? I, I believe that would. I, I just, yeah, I guess I'm looking at it that it would, it's almost inappropriate in the fact that it can cause morale um, issues for other people. But if it's a different job, completely different job, which presentation kind of shows all the things that he's accomplished but we don't know was that always that was that's part of the job what I'm saying but if you're going to increase the responsibilities and make it, it is a different position that would make it could make it different I, I just felt for a one year for someone that's been here a year that that was a very large race you know and, and that's that's the way I'm looking at it so. I agree with Mrs. Chanel on that point. And if there is to be a job description change, I think that it should come before the board as a decision by the board. Not, I mean, I appreciate that Sean wants to take things on and make his job better, but that's, that's his decision. That wasn't the board asking him to do that. And so I agree with Mrs. Chanel. The other question I had is, what did his salary go up from the time he was hired to January 1? And now we're going to give him another 15% on top of that. That's To me, that's not right either so I will be voting no on it also well wait till we call for a vote yes anybody like to know what other fire marshals are making around the area no mr. chairman that's not part of the conversation tonight but thank you just a simple question Perry miss McDonald prefers not to hear that I'd like to know uh, just for NACPA which is a part-time fire marshal assistant chief position $68,000, Commerce Township 73, White Lake 78, Wixom 50. Brandon's going to create a position this year, um, which will be in the 70s. Uh, we're getting a lot of bang for the buck for what Sean is doing. Uh, Sean, a lot of what he showed in his presentation aren't part of the ordinance and weren't part of the fire marshal position. That was something to improve our community. Um, it, it's going to like I mentioned in the letter, he's going above and beyond to provide a great service to our community. And that was why I made the recommendation that I did. Well, I agree with that 100%. Um, so we have a uh, motion and we have a second. And we've had some discussion, so let's have a vote. Can I just ask one more question? Sure. Um, why has this changed so much, though? I mean, when, when we created this position, it was... There was a lot of discussion about it, and the board did not fully agree on making it half and half position like that. So it really has totally changed 
for us from what it started out as and now that, you know, and I agree that he's done wonderful things and everything. It's just this big change really that, I, so I, it really has. So maybe it should have been brought about in a different way that it's gonna be realigning the position or something that. I completely understand it from what it was to what it mm -hmm. is now. Right. It has completely changed and there are a lot more benefits we're getting to it. Um, when it was done before, it was done by a part-time fire marshal slash part-time uh, recruitment retention officer slash part-time ordinance enforcement. Uh, no, 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 something else, all under Doug's <laughs> realm. And then we had uh, Bill, Bill doing Bill the ordinance part of it. Mm -hmm. That was his only job. He went out and did the ordinance, and, and that's all it was. This position we created has flourished into a, a amazing beneficial program, not only for the township, the residents, but for my firefighters. They're getting the information that they need, whether he's doing an ordinance inspection and, and notices a fire hazard, notices a unusual uh, limited access area residential property, or a, a, a road hazard where we can't get our fire trucks through. That is, it's priceless what he's providing for the community. I appreciate that. Okay, so, vote please. All right, uh, I vote first, so I'll say, I'll vote yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Motion carries. Next item, uh, new business, fire department staff vehicle purchase. No. Budget amendment. Why don't we, right. the, oh, 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 we gotta do the uh, budget amendments. Okay, let's see. Um, but I'll have to do it in two, <coughs> part, well, two parts, I guess. Uh, motion. Well, Amy, Amy provided a write-up that's in the in the packet. You don't necessarily have to write out or you know read it. It's provided. Okay, there's a budget amendment um, worksheet. Proposed budget amendments for board meeting January 9th, twenty nineteen. Uh, We've got um, general fund expenditures, uh, budget amendment, um, proposed amendment for the township half uh, under ordinance officer wage, uh, proposed amendment is $3,000, moving the new proposed budget to $23,085 per year. And fire fund expenditures uh, out of fire marshal compensation, uh, Three thousand dollars for twenty-three thousand eighty-five um, per year. So the proposed uh, amendment is to add funds to the ordinance officer and fire marshal compensation. <clears throat> Both the general fund and the fire fund have revenues exceeding expenses in their approved twenty nineteen budgets to cover these added expenses. So I make a motion that we approve the budget amendments as presented. Support. Okay, moved and supported. Uh, vote, please. Mrs. McDonald? Yes. 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 Motion carries. Okay, <clears throat> next item is uh, chill at the mill. No, fire department staff. B. Yes. Oh, back to that. I keep wanting to skip this thing. Uh, fire department <laughs> staff vehicle purchase. Uh, Chief, have at it. You've been doing a good job of talking on this one here. So. All right. Um, in August, we got an approval for a capital village um, to build fire stations, replace fire apparatus, which is a large-scale purchase for us. Um, one of the, the items that wasn't included in our, our capital was staff vehicles. Currently, we have two staff vehicles. We have a 2016 GMC Canyon, and we have a 2007 uh, Chevy Tahoe. Um, the Chevy Tahoe, over the past three and a half years, we've invested 12,500 and some odd dollars in the vehicle. These vehicles are, are driven hard. They're driven very hard. They're taken from uh, a cold engine to 100 miles an hour. A fast rate, getting to a, an incident in the middle of the night, um, hard stops, hard stop, or hard starts. They're they're treated really rough. They're not designed for the type of activities that we we 
put them through. Um, with that in mind, just like fire, uh, our old rescue one, it got to a point that we were just putting more and more money into it. We're at that point with our, our Tahoe right now. It's still going to remain in our fee fleet, but it's going to be put into a more of a support um, position. Um, I'd like to recommend the purchase of a new staff vehicle, uh, a 2019 Dodge Ram SSV. SSV stands for Special Service Vehicle. Um, the Special Service Vehicles are designed for emergency responses. They were designed with pursuit or, or police functions in, in uh, mind. They have larger rotors for better stops. They have bigger alternators, suspension, the whole nine yards. They're, they're more designed towards this type of a, a field or this type of activity. Um, when I started looking at all this stuff, Oakland County has a cooperative purchasing agreement similar to what we did when we bought the fire truck through Rochester. They had a cooperative purchasing agreement. So I looked at Oakland County's uh, information. Uh, thanks to Matt Snyder for getting that information for me. I did contact their vendors for Dodge. Uh, they did send me over the, the information and the pricing for the vehicle. Um, I'll just read this little snip here. Uh, I also went to Zot, uh, Dodge Ram in town because I'm all about keeping the dollar local and Zot is such a big supporter for our community that if, if we couldn't find out if they have some sort of, of cooperative agreement already, we'd be foolish. So I did talk to Zot, um, and let me just read this last little blurb. The Zot Auto Group has been a strong community partner for many events within or affiliated with our township. As a strong community partner and to keep our township dollar local, we contacted Zot regarding cooperative purchasing packages. After a brief conversation, the re reutterance of their commitment to the community, the Zot Auto, Auto Group offered this vehicle at a lower price than what the Oakland County bid process price was. On a newer vehicle, the Oakland County bid process is on a 2018. Theirs is for a 2019. Additionally, a business partner that, that Zot works with, AEV American Expedition Vehicles, would like to outfit the vehicle with specialized suspension and appearance package at no additional cost. A similar offer was made in 2017, accepted by the Milford Police Department, and that vehicle is currently on, on a, a patrol right now. Um, they, they were members of the state uh, purchasing group, so if it has to be a, a matter of credentials, being with the state group, I'm sure we can get those numbers for them. But the number is considerably less than what uh, the Oakland County system was, number one. Number two, they're willing to put $10,000 into this vehicle to not only market the performance of the vehicle and the performance of the equipment, but also to provide a, a heavier, beefier, more durable vehicle for the type of responses and activities that we subject it to. For $393 less than a year older vehicle. Yes, I'm sorry. Can a question for you. Yes, ma'am. The new um, fire stations are built, will, they, will that help you be able to house some of these inside in the colder weather? Oh, Is it's not so much possible? the housing inside it's just the whether they're in a warm environment or a cold environment you're still taking them from no oil inside the engines no oil inside the trans to um, uh, as hard as they can work for as long as they can work quick as they can stop and then they're left running for extended periods of time grass uh, fires is another issue you take a standard pickup truck out in the field and bounce that thing around you'll get suspension components that are broken the ss V components are designed for what they would normally use for desert performance type activities where they're bouncing these trucks over sand dunes and hills and rocks. And the AEV actually takes it a step further. And, and it's at no cost to us. It's a $10,000 upgrade. It's great. I do have pictures of the Milford Police truck if anybody wants to see it. It's kind of a uh, pretty. Did we follow the township bidding policy with this? We did not go up to a, a, a bid process only because we, we were, our intention was to use the Oakland County Purchasing Agreement, much like I said, much like we did with the um, fire apparatus in 2017. 
Flavor apparatus, that's a different story. And so that's my question. Did we follow bid policy? We followed the, the same bid. No. We, we followed the same purchasing process that we used for the fire. That's not our bid policy. Well, we can, um, if this is viewed as being outside of our purchasing policy, we can say that we're waiving it in, in using the a comparable price to what's available through the county bid process. Taking advantage of uh, the resources provided by the county and cutting down on the amount of work that we had to put into it to achieve probably a better objective. I, I can't, the only thing I can tell you is that my intention was to use the Oakland County system. I got a better price with more options on it than what the Oakland County system was. As far as just how it works in the, the board portion, I, I don't know. I, I can just, I did my work. <coughs> Gary, go, go ahead. Plus price. I apologize that I, I did not anticipate that issue or I would have brought the purchasing policy with me. I seem to recall that it may have a provision that allows waiver of the competitive bidding if it's a single source, uh, you know, a cooperative pricing like has been referred to. But even if it doesn't, I would concur with Tammy's comment that the board does have the ability to waive the policy. So, so we make a motion. Um, I'll make a motion to waive board policy uh, and to uh, enter into an agreement with uh, Zot Auto Group for the purchase of a 2019 Dodge Ram SSV uh, half ton pickup truck for the price of $29,000. Just add in your motion waive board policy if necessary. Uh, waive board policy if necessary. Support. Can you move to support it? Uh, vote, please. Discussion? Sure. Discussion. Um, yeah, just um, if it is, you said, if necessary, waive it. Because I think that that is something we should talk about if it is not already in there in our purchasing policy, that these open county bids, I mean, we all know that these are, you know, I know we use those in Huron Valley Schools, too, that that was standard or whatever you want to say that you know that is a really good price that we are getting because it's a cooperative bid that if that's not in there maybe we should put that in there as part of the policy that just throwing that out there i just know how long it would take my computer to fire up so i could look it up for you and I don't think we well i think at that. this point it's not necessary we because we've requested a waiver of the policy so i'm comfortable with your motion as made um, that's my motion. And you seconded it. I did. So, uh, uh, vote please. Uh, Mr. Howe? Yes. 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 No. Yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> I want to add something to that last little part there. Um, part of policy, and it's not that anybody's trying to jack the policy to pieces, but we could have added enough additional cost to the $2,900 to make it non-competitive just by advertising. When you know what your community has to offer, you know that the state has numbers, we know that the county has numbers, you have good solid, in fact, if you look in your documents, you'll see that they're one-to-one -one comparisons. It makes sense to at least go the direction we did. So it's not like you're, somebody's trying to short sheet policy by waiving the policy. It makes it so that the board agrees that it's a viable and, and valuable uh, change in policy for the moment. It doesn't change it, the policy forever. Yes, Chief. Yeah, I did want to add that when we purchased the 2016, we paid $34,000 for that truck. That truck sticker price was right around 42. Uh, James just brought up a good point with a picture of Fiat Chrysler Auto Group, uh, the Dodge um, SSV vehicle. The minimum sticker price is forty thousand dollars. The the price that I gave you is well over, or the price that I gave you the sticker on through the county bid system is well over um, thirty nine thousand three hundred dollars. Then it's another ten thousand dollars on top of it. We're getting a, a an amazing price on this vehicle. Better bang for the buck. Yes. So. 
Uh, comment? Yes. First, I like we're I like that we're staying local. I think that's important. I just I'm curious why is the Oakland County preferred vendor in Lapeer? Lapeer's in Oakland County <laughs> because they do the, the bid process. No, I know, but it just makes this. It, it, you I think know. if it's an Oakland County preferred place, you'd be buying something out of Guess Oakland County. Guess where the Ford County. dealer's at? What's that? Guess where the Ford dealer's at? Wayne County. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just saying it always catches my attention that we're trying to, you know, if you're Oakland County, you should be buying in Oakland County. The Chevy dealer was in the West Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids. <laughs> okay, never mind. Well, at least that was close. But they've, they've done a ton of work and it's a great program. It, no, I agree. It's much just, more. It's crazy to me that we're going all over the place and should be in your county. But I get it. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank to you. both of you guys for doing a great job tonight. Um, thank you. So I'll move on to the difficult stuff. Um, item E, 10 C E is, is oh, oh, we need to vote. Sorry. Oh, what? We didn't vote. We did vote, didn't we? Chilton Mill. No. Oh, Chilton Mill. We voted to waive the... Man, we are beating the death out of I thought the here. motion, was it just to waive? No, it included pod yeah. buying it also. And purchasing yeah. as well. Right. Okay. Right. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. So we're good. Chilton Mill. Um, somehow in all of the things that went on with this uh, possible playground uh, that started out as a somewhat of a library project, uh, still somewhat of a library project. <clears throat> we skipped uh, kind of an important step that uh, says that the township board agrees or approves to allow the Chillita Mill to be built at the library. So basically that's what the um, request is. Um, Board approval to build the Chilton Mill at the library as defined by the uh, um, description that was in the. Uh, so the, this is the libraries or the townships? It's the township's Township property. property. Okay. So the what what I'm concerned about with this is the maintenance of this property because being on the Parks and Recreation Committee, I see all the things that need to be done at Duck Lake Pines and at the other you know at um, Hickory Ridge. And there's lots of maintenance issues. There's lots of things that we're not able to do in those parks, like the, the, the rink and then the tennis courts, and we're talking about the paths in there and things. So I'm just wondering how this is going to play in the maintenance on this one, too, when we're having issues with the other ones. Well, I'd say the first thing we need to do is give permission to be able to build it there. And then the next step is January 19th. Uh, I have a meeting with people who have volunteered to assist in promoting and moving it forward, those are things that can all be part of the discussion and, and final description. The final design still needs to be done um, so that it can actually, you know, could be built by any contractor. So there's elements that need to be completed. Uh, if you can't build on the property, then it's a waste of time. So you need permission to build it, and that's what this is, on the property. But how do we give permission to build something when we don't even know who's building it Who's going to own it? Who's responsible for the maintenance of it? That's that's the question that I have. To that's be that's irrelevant at this point. No, it's not. It is. Are you willing to allow? And everybody's seen this, the documents. It's been in the newspaper. There's been plenty of information. It's been brought to the board. It's been shown to the board. At this point, you have to know: Can you build it there? If you can't build it there, then you don't move forward. Well, and I think it's pretty clear. It's owned by the township. It's on township property. It happens to be near the library, but it doesn't make it the library's asset. You know? Right, and that, that's that's my concern, though, is like I said, there's lots of issues on the two parks we already have maintaining them, and I'm concerned about having a third park, you know, and the maintenance and things, the issues with it. That's my concern. Mr. Hamill, yes, sir. If the if the board were, would this be kind of like what we did a few motions back, board's notice of intent on the uh, on WOTA? I mean, is that what you're looking for? Is some affirmative nod by the board that, yeah, we like the idea, but maybe addressing some of the concerns, subject to the details being fleshed out later. I mean. I don't know if you could put a subject to the detail being flushed out later. I think it's. Well, that, I, you, I mean, you either right. agree to let the, the, the property be used for a project like that. The library would like, to, maybe, who knows? The library may decide that they want to take care of it. You have to first be able to say the library doesn't own the land. 
but they're promoting it. So if it was a library and it wasn't me involved in it, is that something that's going to make a difference? It appears that way to me. Well, then it should be a request from the library asking to use that property, just like when they built the building there. If this is a library a, project and the library is going to maintain it, then the library should be asking for permission to build this thing. This is a community project that is going to be on community property. No, it's township property. It's, it's not community, community property. No, it's township owned property you're asking Nitpick for. Nitpick the terminology, Mary. It's community property. It's paid for by taxpayers' dollars. Same difference, terminology. No, it's not the same. If you're not happy with it, then you have the opportunity to vote against it when we when I ask for the motion. This is a ridiculous conversation. A ridiculous it is too. Conversation. Is All it right, let's not. So let's just, just vote. We have, so could we vote on this with the option of saying based on the final plan? And I think it's valid to say that yeah, you're going to have to figure out what the maintenance plan is going to be. You know. That's going to have to be a consideration <coughs> to be presented as the ideas are fleshed out. But it's it's a very rough concept at this point. So how can right. you say, well, it's the maintenance is going to be covered this way or that way when you don't even know what the project's really going to look like? I think what the idea is is that before we go getting a whole committee of people all riled up and gung ho and going on this, we have to know is the township board going to allow it to happen. And if you're going to use a single criteria, which is a fear of maintenance, which you're making statements about the parks are in need of a lot of maintenance, I disagree with you. There's minor amounts of maintenance that need to be done, but there's some issues in the parks that are severe costs that are not things that would be the same kind of cost in this project. But it's one of these scenarios where you need permission to build on the township property. That's a simple question. It is pretty clear, I think, what the project is. It's been very made very clear to the public what the project is. Um, it's been demonstrated here. It's been shown to the Planning Commission. Uh, everybody that's been shown to uh, has been done nothing but given positive responses to it. <coughs> it's a scenario where we have no playgrounds that are similar in our area. People leave our community. The library would love to have outdoor activity component that would draw in not just the kids but the adults to come along with it. It's a very positive project. <clears throat> to limit it to the point where it appears that the decision making is really based on maintenance alone I think is, a, is kind of a, a poor uh, approach to it. I think it's a simple approach. Is the board willing to allow this project to be built on that parcel in the location that was specified? That's all the question is. In your view, is are you planning on bringing any more finalized plans back to the board? Absolutely. And so, you're going to need them for every aspect of the project. So at some, we'll have additional opportunities for weighing in on different That's aspects of it. Right. Yes, right? Sure. <laughs> okay. No, that's a legitimate question. Yeah. What, would, what would it come back to the board for and at what stage? I mean, I'm not saying it would have to. If, if a motion were made tonight, to allow the chill at the mill to be built on this property, period. That would allow it to be built on that property and okay, I'm deal gonna with any take just a moment. I'm gonna give go get some, some data. Are we taking a quick break? Take a quick break. Okay. Okay, let's no, I have a Thank you. 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 Thank 
Everybody will love one. Sorry. All right. For demonstration purposes, everybody in this community got a free copy of the newspaper, which had all of this information in it, which I think very clearly defines what we're talking about. It shows pretty much to scale, just to scale, all the components. It shows what the Structures would look like. There's scale model of the project. There's sample photos of the different elements of it. It's not a matter of understanding what's there. If you can't understand what what's designed in, or going to be designed into it from the documentation that's given to you, you're never going to understand what a what a, an architectural drawing of it will do. So you're going to vote tonight to approve building that. To approve the building use that. of the land for this. So then when it comes time to build that, you'll come back and talk about that. Yes. And talk about the money involved and vote on it. Yes, and it's not going to be involving township money. It's public donations. All. Business all donations. Public. Absolutely, okay. sir. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've already gotten the first donation. $3,000. Somebody has already handed us a check for $3,000 because they think the concept is that good. So, it's a simple thing. Do you want to use the property or do you not want to use the property? And that's what the question is for this project, which will turn out to look like what you see here. And I think there's more than enough stuff there. And the other component of it is, yes, I designed it. I built the model and I did everything for free. I did not charge my time off for anything or charge the township for any of it. I did it as a community project. I thought we paid a paradise uh, invoice for that. No, you did not. Back. You did not. Well, what was that for then? I don't know what it was for at that point in time. It wasn't for this. But you did not pay, we did not pay for any of this. What we did pay for, is some advertising. And if the township wants the money back, I'm sure we can get the money back. Well, since it wasn't authorized by the board, I think you should get it back. Well, that's your that's selfish opinion. opinion but, yes, uh, my opinion. So anyways, the motion is that the township board approve the construction of the chill at the mill as inferred, designed, presented at the parcel property located by the library is defined in the description in the memo. Support. Okay, moved and supported. A vote, please. Uh, Mrs. Chilmeth. No. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Motion carries. <clears throat> All right, next item is higher crossing guard. Okay, I'm going to make the motion that we recommend hiring Thomas Kaiser as a part-time backup crossing guard to start employment Monday, January 7th at a rate of pay at $15.52 per hour pending a background check. Support. Moved and supported. A vote, please. Mrs. Cooper? Yes. 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 Motion carries. I make a motion. Uh, to approve the hiring of Edna Green as a part-time security for the Highland Activity Center to start employment on Monday, January 7th, 2019 at a rate of $10 per hour, not to exceed 29 hours per week, based on her background check being approved. Support. Moved and supported. The vote, please. I vote yes. 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 Motion carries. Okay, the next item, G, is Resolution 19-04 to approve Michigan Department of Transportation contract number 185517 with the Charter Township of Highland to authorize the supervisor and clerk to sign a contract 
This is the contract for the, uh, the uh, pathway that our portion of you know, is 100 and where's that number at? $135,300 is a uh, portion to help cover the cost of building and extending the pathway from uh, Cobblestone to Tipsico Lake Road. Support. Okay, so that was a motion on my part. Okay. Moved and supported. Vote, please. Um, Mrs. McDonough. Yes. 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 Motion carries. All right. Meeting adjourned. <clears throat>